spiked out I could trip a referee Tell by my attitude That I most definitely leave from Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of This Week in Startups. I've got my game face on. People were stealing stacks from me, and I've, I've got my swagger back. Uh, last night, Open Angel Forum in San Francisco, the third city. Tyler Crowley uh, is not in studio today. He's on rem- in a remote location that's undisclosed. Tyler, are you okay? I'm fine. People are concerned you're not in the studio. Uh, no, and oddly, my camera looks better when I'm not in the studio. Right. Uh, you, you actually look better on your uh, webcam than you do on the uh, studio cam. Uh, we'll have to get that fixed. Uh, last night, Open Angel Forum, San Francisco, 20 angels, six companies. Uh, what did you think? Awesome. Best one yet. All right, there you have it, folks. Another colorful uh, commentary by Mr. Tyler Crowley. Uh, but seriously, who was there? What, what did you think of the companies? The companies have, are now publicly known. Did you have a favorite company? Who did you have the most interesting conversation with as an angel investor? Oh, man. Um, you know what I like to judge it by is how long everyone stays after the presentations. And at L.A., people tended to stay for about an hour after all the presentations were done, yes. which was good, right? We're like, wow, it was great. Everyone's hanging around for an hour afterwards. Boulder, likewise, about an hour and a half. Last night, two and a half hours? Two and a half hours. Yeah. It was, you don't have to go home, guys, but you cannot stay here. Right, we had to kick people out. Literally people kicked people out of the restaurant. Yeah. And it was pretty blown out. I have to admit, we did a good job again with the food, and the food is also crucial. Yeah. I mean, Kobe burgers and truffle french fries, I mean, it's just yeah. a true blow. It's so blown. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of great VC, a lot of great angels there, I should say. Uh, and a lot of the new, like, young gun angels. You, you had Matt Mullenweg, who started, you know, the founder of WordPress, who was on episode. Somebody tell me in the chat room what episode Matt Mullenweg was. We should start referring to people by their episode. You know, like, Annie Duke will be a 37, and, you know, Brian Alvey's a 1. Anyway, um, Matt Mullenweg was there. Kevin Rose. Uh, also, um, uh, Dave Moran, is that his name? Moran, yeah. Moran, who was one of the uh, original Facebook guys who did a lot of the design. He's angel investing. Josh Schechter from Delicious Fame, who's at Google now, who's done 20 different companies. He's an investor in a lot of different, he's an LP, limited partner in a lot of other venture capital firms. So it was a very blown out group of people and uh, six great companies. And it was interesting, the, the, the VC, the angels there rather, didn't know the six companies who presented. Right. Uh, but you know what? One thing that everybody does know, Tyler? Bing. <laughs> Bing is doing a great job sponsoring the show. And next week, there is no show on Sunday. I know it's very tragic. Everybody's very upset that there's no show on Sunday. The reason there is no show next Sunday is because there's a show on Saturday. And the show on Saturday is being uh, live from uh, live broadcast from South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Thanks to the good people, the fine people at Bing, 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 uh, I'm sorry, my show is taped on Fridays, you're right. There is no show on Friday, but there is a show on Saturday. Bing has uh, sponsored This Week in Startups for Austin, Texas, South by Southwest, along with our friends at Sonos. Everybody knows I love the Sonos unit. I paid to put 11 different Sonos units in my house. It was not insignificant, but it's the most blown system ever. If you don't have an S5, you have to go get it. And special thanks to them. The guest, Tony Shea, the CEO and founder, co-founder of Zappos, which just got sold for, uh, I think it was a billion dollars? Mm-hmm. I think this will be the most blown guest we've ever had on the show. Yeah. I don't know if we've ever had a guest who has sold the company for a billion dollars. Nope. Not yet. Matt yeah. Mullenweg's company would go for a billion dollars, maybe. Um, so anyway, if you uh, want to go to this, go to the This Week in Startup site, sign up. First 200 people in line are going to get drink tickets. They're going to give away a bunch of Sonos S5 units. It's going to be crazy. Everybody knows what South by Southwest is about. Technology and getting drunk. I mean, it's essentially what South by Southwest stands for. Not necessarily in that order, but right. People get so... If you're a boss out there and your workers come to you and say, I got to go to South by Southwest. It's got this panel on 
HBase, and there's another thing over here. You know, this is about web standards. It's all nonsense. It's, this is about absinthe. Then there's another party with beer. And there's another party here where we're going to do shots. I mean, people get hammered. And actually, Tony from Zappos has a party bus, a VIP party bus that he's going to be driving around South by Southwest. He's a maniac, but I love Zappos. Anyway, uh, special thanks to the Bing folks and, of course, to Sonos. Uh, we're so lucky with these great sponsors. I mean, they were like, will you do a show there? And I was like, to do a show right at South by Southwest, do you know what that costs? You have to fly six people down there from this, the, this weekend staff. The TriCaster has to go down there. Cameras, hotel rooms. It, it's a very expensive thing. And they're like, we'll do it. I was blown away. Uh, so this is going to be awesome. Uh, and we actually made a poster for it, uh, which is great. And what else? Was it an eventful week? Nothing else happened this week. Pretty uneventful. That's the highlight, yeah. That's the highlight. Sunday, I'm going to the top secret uh, conference, the investment bank that you can't say the name of. Uh -huh. So I've got to go there on Sunday. 200 CEOs in the desert. It's pretty crazy. Uh, people can guess in the chat room which investment bank hosts that. Uh, holy cow, do we have an amazing guest today. Um, I've been waiting for him to be on the show. He is one of my oldest friends. Uh, I met him, gosh, Howard, we met 96 maybe? 96, I think. 1996. Yep. So I met Howard when I was 25 years old and I'm 39 now. So I met Howard 14 years ago. And I was this little snot-nosed kid with a 16-page photocopy. I was busting everybody's chops all over the place. And you know what? Howard was actually very nice to me. I always remember that. And always uh, very much brought me into the community. Uh, and. Tyler is gone for a bit. Okay. Tyler, you have to take off. There'll be no more insights? I have to take off because you're going to have another Skype caller come in. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. And thanks for uh, skipping the show today. Appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> uh, it does have conferencing, you know. I know they do have conferencing. We're, we're going to build a Skype source. Uh, Leo's from This Week in Tech is explaining to us how to build a Skype source. So we're actually we just dropped 10 Gs on the studio. I, this is getting expensive. All right. Uh, I'm such a cheap guy. I just like every time I spend money, it hurts. You know, I know it takes money to spend money, but it just—it's to me as an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. That's uh, it, when I have to write a check. It is like somebody has cut me, and blood is coming out, and I'm watching my blood bleed. And I'm going, oh my god, ten thousand dollars in cameras. Those are the entrepreneurs we love. I, that's but it's OCD at this point. <laughs> it's like an, I don't need to worry about a ten thousand dollars worth of cameras. But if I spend ten thousand dollars in cameras, I I think about it for five hours. That's why I fly jet blue and I don't fly. I know. Yeah. Exactly. That's why I'm going to buy a blue jet when I get my <laughs> money. I was thinking about that today. I, was, I tweeted, like, God damn it, I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years. When do I get the jet? I don't think I'm going to get one. It's not going to happen. But that's okay. It's not environmentally sound. Yeah. I'm so concerned about the environment. <laughs> I'm, I'm not so concerned. Uh, if I can get a jet, I will get a jet. Uh, so, uh, Howard, gosh, there's a million ways for me to introduce you, but I think the simplest thing to say is you have been investing in technology companies for three decades. That's it. I have had people on the program who've been venture capitalists for 10 years. I've had people who've been investing for 10 years. I've never had somebody who's had three times that amount. We're going to have an awesome discussion about the 80s and the software revolution, the 90s and the internet and the IT revolution, and now and the bubbles. And I really want to talk to you about the ups and downs and how you look at the macro economy and everything you've learned about what makes an entrepreneur great. But first, we're going to take a question because everybody knows Ask Jason. You've watched the show before, yes. so you know about the Ask Jason I segment. Do. It's everybody's favorite, so we put it right at the front of the show. Uh, and thank you to Ustream for sponsoring the show. Uh, I stream, you stream, we all stream for you stream. Uh, you stream, $75 million investment. Pretty impressive, Howard, yes. Yep. Uh, from Masa over at SoftBank, uh, my good friend. And they are crushing it. And every week it seems like this live streaming thing is real. It seems to be really getting there. And it's what Comcast and the cable companies have wanted to do with their on demand, but the live stuff is even better. The live stuff has got a whole different dimension. Yep. This is what Josh Harris envisioned with Sudo. Yes. Video, chat room. Mm -hmm. It's Ustream. I mean, that, this is Josh. This is the, the this grandchild is of Josh Harris. Is he still right living here? at your uh... He's still in the pool house, but I think he's going to New York. Uh, <laughs> not that there's any problem with him living in my pool house for 14 months. <laughs> Married with a kid. Oops. Oof. <laughs> Baby. He's, but he's my best friend. I got to <laughs> help him out. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. Uh, anyway, Ustream, what an incredible uh, sponsor they've been. And oh, I have to. 
thank uh, NetDNA, NetDNA, it's a CDN, Content Delivery Network. All of you guys were complaining because Blip was so slow. Well, Blip's free, and so they throttle the, the speed. I mean, you, you get what you pay for. Blip's an awesome service for you put your stuff in and you can send it to everything. So we still use Blip, but we just change where we're pointing the files to. Maron. It, people are getting one megabit, two megabit, three megabit downloads of the show, and we got the file size down correctly last week. The show went da download. How fast? I'm asking people in the uh, forget about it in the chat room. How fast did you guys download the show last week? It was some people were telling me 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. They got the show. Uh, so, and that's all because of NetDNA. NetDNA. They are our new CDN, and they are improving our download speeds. Uh, and they're improving download speeds for podcasts everywhere. Let's take a call. Okay, uh, and on the phone, or on the Skype, you guys tell me. Skype. Oh. On the Skype, do we see him or do we just hear him? Okay, we're going to just hear him. On the Skype, we have Pablo uh, calling from 4179. That's not the United States. Where are you calling from, Pablo? Hello, Jason. I'm calling from Switzerland. Oh, you're calling from Switzerland? Yes. Oh, obviously we know this week in startups is a huge contingent in Switzerland. What time is it in Switzerland? It's 22, 10, in the, 10 at night. So it's 10 o'clock at night. And like most people in Switzerland, you're tuned in to the live uh, telecast of the uh, This Week in Startups <laughs> program. You have a question for uh, myself and for Howard Morgan, legendary investor with 30 years of experiences, both good and bad. We're going to get into that. Uh, give us your question. Okay, uh, we actually pitched at Shark Tank some time ago. Okay. And your prescription was a follow up. So, if it's okay with you, I'd like to give the follow up. Okay. So, here at blog.com, it's a service where we narrate blogs so ah, people yes. can listen to them on the go, like a podcast. Yes. But to keep up with the blogs. So, since last time we started to narrate in many more blogs, we are narrating five major blogs. We are typically publishing several posts a day. In February, we have 4,000 downloads, about half of them from the US, 30% is mobile. Um, a lot of them come from subscribers, not people just passing by, which for us is great. We already have the first advertiser, thanks to you. Thank you, Jason. The, the advertiser hear us at, at this week in startups and he decided oh, really? to advertise with us. He, he really wanted to support us and he actually got a mail of thank you from one of the listeners saying, thank you for supporting Hero Blog. We really love the service. Okay, so this has been an incredible plug for Hero Blog. What is the question? So the question is Hero Blog is a boutique shop. We know that, but we want to go big. And we are thinking of, we, we started to build a product that is going to be huge, that we are building it out of Hero Blog but we'll have to build another product, an intermediate product before. So the, the question is, how do we pitch that we are building these products to get to the last one, which is going to be huge? Do we just pitch the huge one where we have nothing to show for? Do we pitch the small one, the small ones as steps? How do we approach okay. investors with this situation? So I'm going to repeat your question, just so everybody's sure, and I'm sure I got it correct. Your question is, you have a small but promising product you have a big product vision, and you're going to be talking to investors, and you want to know if you should give them the big vision or the small vision. Yes. OK. Um, I can tell you one thing, that nothing pleases an investor more than somebody who has accomplished something. When they can actually see that you've demonstrated that you've built a good product, that it's in the market, they love that. Uh, showing them where it's going to go, that's nice too. Showing them a big vision, that's very important if you want to raise a lot of money. So it really depends on the investors. If you're going to Sequoia Capital, if you're going to Kleiner Perkins or Benchmark or some of these large firms, a lot of times they, they're looking for bi billion dollar businesses. And if you come in with an idea that's going to be a $25 million business or a $50 million business, in some cases they may not be as interested. I'm not saying they're not interested, but they're, go they're swinging for the fences, so to speak. So you do want to have a big vision and take small steps. I would say you're doing it exactly right. Howard, what's your advice? I, I agree completely. We, we do want to know that there's a big vision there. 
uh, because you do want those giant exits. In fact, you know, Vinod Kosla has very explicitly said all, all he cares about are the billion dollar exits. Right. But we want to see somebody who's accomplished something and your small steps, you know, the current the hero blog and what you've gotten so far is a good way to show people that you know how to make some money, you know how to get customers to actually pay you something or advertisers in, in this case. And then you have the big vision to show us as to where it's going to go so that it will eventually make you and the investors a lot of money. Um, I'm looking at your product and I just have to say I'm very proud of you. Uh, you guys took the prescription well and you made the product look very clean. We can pull up my laptop here for a second. And here's here a blog. Uh, if you guys remember, they basically take blog posts from people of note and they make them into audio files because people want to listen to them when they're in the gym. This is a brilliant idea. Uh, how it becomes a business, I don't know exactly, but you said you got a sponsor. Interestingly, you went for the tech vertical. This is a very smart move. Tech people are you know, going to adopt stuff early, they're going to give you feedback, and they're going to be rabid consumers. I see Balsamic, you've taken the Balsamic blog and you've made it into a podcast. Guess what? We were talking about Balsamic for the last two weeks here. It's a wireframing piece of software that seems to be sweeping the user interface community. That's a delightful thing to see there. Uh, and then also I see uh, that you have Coding Hara, one of the co-founders of Stack Overflow, and you have Joel on software, Joel Spolsky, who is a good friend of mine who's called into the show and who is a brilliant guy who writes long pieces. And you have his stuff as MP3 files, three minutes, five minutes. These are great little right. chunks. And I'm going, I want to subscribe to this. And when I go play poker next week, I want to have this on my podcast. This is a great job. It's really becoming a King Pelling piece of software. When we open the Open Angel Forum in Switzerland, you might get to be able to present there. And I'm not even joking about that. Somebody emailed us this week about really? Open Angel Forum <laughs> Switzerland. Uh, well, if, if you open the one in London, we'll be there. London is actually, we have about 15 people who want to help us with that. And London will be the first city we do in Europe, obviously, for obvious reasons. Um, there's a lot of money there. Uh, tell me, how much money, are, how many people are in the company? How much money are you looking to raise? Um, there's two people in the company. Uh, we still don't know how much money to raise. Um, we, we have like steps, like with $10,000, we can improve this much with, I don't know, $200,000, we'll probably will be able to develop the, the huge product, the huge idea, and, and, and push it until it becomes uh, profitable. Um, how do you get the, who reads the, um, who actually does the, the, the audio book reading of these? Uh, we have a narrator that we pay, ah. a professional narrator, yes. Cool. And so I see they're doing Seth Glowden's blog and... Yeah, this is a very smart idea. I like it a lot. I think I would use it. So, um, and would you consider relocating the company to the United States, New York, Los Angeles, or San Francisco? Yes, of course. Okay. So then what you probably need to do, since there's not much going on in Switzerland, no offense to our Swiss friends. Friends. Yeah. I, yes. I don't mean to be insulting, but there's not exactly the actual you know, tech hub of the world. Uh, if you come to New York, LA, and San Francisco, or any pick one of those cities, even Seattle or Austin, Boston, or DC, any of those cities, you're going to get people who are interested in this idea. It's pretty compelling. You would actually take a meeting, Howard? Absolutely, take a meeting. Switzerland is compelling for pharma, but not for this kind of tech. Exactly. <laughs> so there you have it. You you know you're sitting there freezing your ass off, and you could be meeting with Howard or many other people. So you got to get out of Switzerland. No yep. offense. Uh, the, the only thing stopping us to move to to the states is the visa issues and oh. we're hoping for the startup visas, the startup visa movement oh. to take off. We signed on to that. This is, this is infuriating. This country was built off of the innovations of people who were not born here. And now all of a sudden we change and we say we only want ideas from and, and CEOs of companies and founders from within this country. It is the stupidest move we've ever made in the history of the country. George Bush is responsible for a large part of it, and Obama's responsible for not acting quick enough to clean up this mess that George Bush has created. It's been a decade since we've let people into the country to create companies. Howard, it's how a, big of an it's, issue is this? It's a, it's a nightmare issue. In fact, I, I meet with companies all the time. In the last week, I've met with two companies where I had to ask the question, oh, so you're from uh, Canada or you're from, in, in one case, uh, Europe. Uh, what's your visa status? I, yeah. I don't want to ask an entrepreneur what his visa status is or her visa right. status, but you have to because we've had, we had one case where we, there was an entrepreneur who couldn't get back in the country for a year because he was playing the game of 
visitor visas and stuff like that. Okay. And that, so we have worked with uh, Senator Schumer in New York and other people, and of course the startup visa movement that we've just said, to try to push the fact that A, uh, anyone who gets a, a college degree in the U.S. should get a visa. Not yes, a, of course. Absolutely, because that's, what that's where we built in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Yeah, so if we're going to pay for your college or we're going to participate in some yep. way, and you going to college here and you get your degree, master's degree, PhD, MIT, Harvard, Stanford, <laughs> I mean, but then we're going to kick you out of the country? And not get the benefit of it, absolutely. And get no benefit. So basically you suck out of our education system then bring it back to your country. I mean, no offense, doesn't fit something like a great deal for us. A immigration is an issue that I, I feel and, and some of the other senators and congressmen I've talked to that Obama should have tackled before health care in the sense that it was one that he probably could have gotten through more easily. Right now, he, he can't focus on it for another year. Yeah, so uh, I need one of the super fans to cut a message right now, starting now. Message to uh, President Obama. This is Jason Calacanis from This Week in Startups. I voted for you. I believed in you. You've been a horrible disappointment to me. You are not focused on what matters, which is creation of jobs and companies. This is a disaster. Healthcare is not as important. It's important. It is clearly not as important as people having jobs. Let's get them jobs first. And let's get these founders into the country. So check out StartupVisa.com and let's solve this problem. You're supposed to be a man of action. And all you want to do, Mr. Obama, please, stop with trying to please everybody. It's a waste of time. Be bold. Dare to be great. You're a terrible disappointment right now, and I have to just tell you that honestly. End message. Okay. That's it. I'm sorry. I had yep. to get it off my chest. I mean, do you feel the same way? I I'm frustrated. I'm very, I was an Obama supporter. I'm very frustrated with what's happened, with the way he's approached uh, the dealings with Congress, with the way he's approached the issues. Energy, infrastructure, immigration are things he could have gotten past, built the, bay, built the solid record of success, and then hit health care. Right. Uh, which, ne which is needed. I mean, there's no question that it's needed. Right. But uh, the job creation areas, uh, energy, where are we going to create the next set of jobs? Solar energy, wind energy, Batteries. alternative energy, battery technology. Nuclear. I'm a big fan of nuclear. Me but too. As you know, at Idea Lab, we're doing a lot of energy uh, companies. Yeah. Fire up the nukes. Five, well, five, that ta it takes 20 years to build a nuke, 12 of which are legal. It's unbelievable. Yeah. France, 90% nuclear. Yeah. China's got like 50 nuclear uh, although plants. They're not, although they're still 90% coal, but they do have right. a lot of plants going in. And that's Japan, 50% nuclear. Japan, which had the only nuclear uh, warfare ever, yes. is 50% nuclear. In the history of it, right. Yeah. They, Go figure. It's a really astute point. Yeah. Uh, it's really, it's stunning to me uh, what a disappointment he is. Would you say a disappointment? Yes. Okay. I'm just, I'm just, I, I, don't, I don't want people to think that I'm like a Republican or conservative and I'm beating up on Obama. I'm libertarian. I'm, I just want things to get done right. and make the government small. That's basically my position, I think. Well, you know, making it smaller, making it the right size. When Clinton left office, we had, we had a surplus. A budget surplus. A big one. So, I mean, it's yeah. just things have gone. Then we sent $800 to every American <laughs> who then proceeded to mortgage their house three times over. Yes. And they really needed that $800 check. We couldn't leave that in the coffers, no? Crazy. Anyway, uh, Pablo, great job, and uh, you're doing everything right, except you're living in the wrong country. Uh, I apologize for the xenophobic ways of the United States and our loss uh, in not getting a great entrepreneur like you over here. I apologize on behalf of the United States and President Obama. <laughs> People in Switzerland, congratulations. You've just kept an entrepreneur in all those jobs in your country. We suck. Uh, we'll talk to you soon, Pablo. Thank you very much. I mean, it's, just, it's absurd yeah. we're having this conversation. It is. Great entrepreneur wants to come here. We could be setting up meetings with him. He would create, that, that company would get a million dollars of funding? He would certainly half get million? funding. He, you know, whatever, if half million, million, he'd create 10 jobs. Yeah. It, that's significant. 10 US jobs. The, the problem with, it, with the xenophobes is, you know, he's going to take an American job. No, he's going to create American jobs. So you let one person right. in to create 10 American jobs. Right. They're worried that you let... Skim the cream across the entire globe. All, everybody wants to live here because of the quality of life. It's a beautiful country, all the freedoms we have here. So just skim the cream. Take all these great entrepreneurs away from the other countries, put them here, and let them create the jobs here. We did it through the 80s and 90s. If you look at the South Asian community that's built up in Silicon Valley, yeah. all, all the, you know, all the entrepreneurs Indians? from India and, and, and oh those my countries. God. Unbelievable, and they've been great. It's great for the country, and now they're giving back to India as well, so it's been great for both countries. Um, it's crazy. And then you know what the interesting thing is? Everybody complains to me, like, oh my God, how come you don't have any women on the program? Uh, or, you know, at a conference or something mm -hmm. like that. And where are the people of color? And I'm just like, okay, wait a second.
Number one, a conference producer or the host of a show can't change the demographics of an industry. I can't wave my wand and magically change the CEO and venture capital communities to be what I believe the diversity should be. But you notice nobody ever mentions, like, where are the Indians or the Asians? Because I've had more Indians and Asians in all my conferences than white guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, the white guys need, have a case to be complaining now. They're not getting fair representation. What happened to all the white guys? I'm, I'm, <laughs> o- I'm still okay with where we are. I think we're doing okay. <laughs> we're doing okay. White guys can't complain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just always find that. The, so the, this is a message to the people who complain about the composure of panels at conferences. Composition. Composition. Yeah. Panel composition. Don't be ridiculous. The person who's running the conference cannot... Do you know how many invites Meg Whitman... Katarina Fakey or pick the dynamic woman CEO founder out there. They get, you know, Gina from Ning. They get like 100 speaking gigs a month because people are so desperate to get a woman CEO on a panel that I've talked to them about it. They're like, I, Jason, I can't make it to that because I have, I'm speaking at these seven things in that month. I can't do an eighth. Well, we, we have some women CEOs in the first round portfolio, and Ideal Lab has been very active. Of course, the president of Ideal Lab, Marsha Goodstein, is a woman. Yes. Uh, I have three daughters who are very yeah. accomplished. You I have, have a daughter. You have a daughter, so yeah. you should be looking out to the future of that. My daughter's going to be the ultimate. I'm, I'm raising, uh, I'm like Tony Stark. That's what I'm raising. My daughter's going to be Tony Stark, the okay. female version of. She's going to be making all kinds of battle suits and everything. I already talked to her about it. I talk to her every day about being an entrepreneur. This poor girl. <laughs> all right. Uh, Tyler, any feedback on the previous caller from Switzerland? Um, or uh, <clears throat> I didn't, I couldn't. Participate. I had to sit out on the sidelines on that one. So I didn't really get to hear what was going on. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure if you have any insights that I don't forget you there on the teleprompter. No uh, okay. Uh, we have second call for Ask Jason. Didn't realize that. Let's get uh, Stephen Young on the phone. Here we go. On the regular phone. Not the quarterback, though. No. Okay. <laughs> Steve Young calling from the 404. No, 210. No. 210. 210. Tell us what the 210 is. San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, Texas. Oh, the San Antonio Spurs beat my Knicks in 94. I'll never get over it. Hey, so I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I just wanted to echo um, what you all were saying about the startup visa. I am an immigrant here, um, and I hope uh, entrepreneurs do, and hope to create uh, jobs, you know, eventually. And I know lots of other immigrant entrepreneurs who would love to do the same thing, too. So I think the startup visa movement is great. Uh I, for one, welcome you to our country uh, and hope you create many jobs here. You have a question for us. Let's hear it. I do have a question. Um, Do you have any guidance for setting the salaries of founding partners when trying to raise angel or VC money? Okay, this is a great question. So your question, just to be very clear about it, is do we have any advice on what the founder's salary should be at an angel investing or Series A round? Uh, this, is a, this is a great question. Howard, how do you approach it? Well, uh, at the angel round in particular, we look at what you can accomplish with the amount of money you're going to raise. And if uh, we, we prefer to see salaries that are relatively low for the founders at that stage, uh, which is to say between fifty and 100000 depending on the city and you know, what, it, what it costs to live rationally. We don't want you, you know, begging for food or anything. Right. Uh, and and we, you should take that into account. But you want to stretch the money, we often see founders take relatively low salaries. Once we get a serious A round, a few million dollars in the company, then we think you should go to, to below market because you've got a lot of equity, but still reasonable salaries. In that case, maybe 125. We don't ever want to see salaries starting with twos uh, yeah. in, in this. And, and then it depends sort of on experience, age, a lot of other factors play in there. Sure. Um, I'm going to have to go with that. I think as you get older as an entrepreneur and you raise more amounts of money, you have more capital needs, like say families and stuff like that. Uh, there's actually a double standard. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, people will look at it and say, you know what, to get this CEO, they've got a mortgage, three kids in private school, we're going to have to pay them a quarter million dollars a year or $300,000 a year or $200,000 a year. And the, the VCs will say, you know what, we're going to bite the bullet on that. It's going to be the exception in our portfolio. Mm-hmm. Most of the portfolio makes $100,000 for a CEO. But we really want this guy or gal. Uh, I mean, you've had yeah. this situation. Uh, that's when you're bringing someone in. If they're right. a founder, it's a right. little different. So right. if they're founding it, they know what they're signing up for. Right. If we have to bring in a great CEO, absolutely, we've right. had that situation. We try, and we often, or almost always actually, offer them the following kind of choice. 
You can have 175 and, and X percent. You can have 200 and X minus 1 percent. You can, and so on. Right. So you, you make the choice as to how much cash versus equity you want. Right. And we give you a range. And it's a little bit of a tell. Of course. <laughs> and if somebody picks the high end of the range, does that make you less interested in them? Or is it a red flag? It, it's a little bit of a flag. That, mini you know, flag. A mini flag. You know, how much do they really value the equity? If right. they're not really valuing the equity, then what are they trying to build? Because we're valuing only the equity. Exactly. That's because you're, inv you're investors yeah. in it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Stephen, good answer? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I do have another question. If, yeah. um, so let's say you have your series A or B. When, when your founding partners or maybe executives in the company want to increase in salary, do they typically approach your board for approval? Um, okay, so this second question is, do you approach your board before raising your salary? And the answer to that is yes. Absolutely yes. Yes. Uh, you, it would look really bad if you were to be like, yeah, you know what, I'm doubling my salary. In fact, what I would do is, when you're raising money, is the perfect time to negotiate or sort of reset your compensation and say, contingent upon closing this round, I would like to move you know, the salary of these three people to this amount. Uh, in recognition of that we got to this point and the company's become this mu you know, much more valuable. Um, you never would want to do it on the slide because it's going to come out anyway. Um, and then you look like you're being sneaky. It's also in our documents that the right. board, the board ha or, or a compensation committee of the board sets salaries of the officers. Right. So you, you really can't do it. Top three positions. Yeah, by yourself. Generally get yeah. picked by the board. Um, yeah, so, and I've seen, just to give you some other stories, I've seen founders who have, you know, not taken a salary for the first year but had that been a loan to the company, and then uh, contingent upon closing the first round, they get paid back that loan, uh, or it gets converted into stock at that price. More likely that. More likely that, or maybe half and half. What kinds of different arrangements like that? So I, I do know people who have taken, for example, uh, I knew somebody who took like their basic living expenses, which were five or six thousand a month. You know, so they're taking a seventy-five thousand dollars salary. But they felt they deserved another seventy-five, so they sort of took that in deferred compensation. Mm -hmm. And you've done this kind of stuff before, yes. uh, and it's contingent on a closing around or something. Yep. And you guys are more than happy to do that. How do you feel about people uh, in a later round, uh, like we've seen a lot, supposedly with Dig and WordPress um, and some other companies? It's been reported that the founders maybe took two, three, four, five million dollars off the mm -hmm. table in or in order to keep them motivated past years four, five, and six. Or, you know, or into years right. four, five, and six of the journey? It's a good question. It's one that we've, uh, we've changed our opinions on over the last couple of years. Because, uh, and we, we do believe it's okay in a later round for the founders to take some money off the table. Not, not too much. And, and not what, how much does that mean? One or two million, probably, unless they, if they're buying a house. I mean, they usually have a specific need. A loft. For a loft. I mean, I always you remember the stories, or oh, I do because I'm old enough, uh, of, of Steve Wozniak talking about how much his house cost because he took... He sold Apple stock early to buy a house, and he said it was his $200 million house <laughs> yeah. uh, if he had held the stock for the, for the right. next couple So even years. for their own good. Even for their own good, they're, right. they may be hurting themselves. But, but, it, but it is good because you don't, there's a limit to how much uh, you want somebody to be, feel deprived and, and be put upon by their spouse. I mean, because what's going to happen is you lose you know, the you've spouse. been doing this, you lose the spouse, you support, Game and that's over. really big because we want this person to be working uh, as much as possible on, on this company. Right. And if you, that means you need buy-in from the spouse. And if the spouse says, and I can't buy a new dress, or we can't take this vacation, or we can't do anything, and you've been doing this for four years, and you've been doing this for four years or five years. And you have another job offer, and headhunters calling you for triple your salary? Yeah. So, Why so should we're, I suffer? So we're, so we're comfortable uh, at, with, so, with, some, with taking some appropriate uh, money off the table. And that's become the norm in the last two or three years. It also because to. exits have taken so much longer. It is taking forever now. I mean, it's basically you start a company, you're in for six, seven years. Well, it's, it's the idea a, yeah. of the of the two, three year flip. It seems like it's gone away. It's gone away. It's gone back. I mean, I did it, but it's gone back to the <laughs> well, weblogs. Was, but it's gone yeah. back to the eighties, right? Where where you started a company, and you know, if you did well, it, it made money in year five and six, and went public in year seven. Yeah, but not not much before that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Stephanie, are you coming to the South by Southwest party next Saturday? Um, do, do you also have tickets for South by Southwest to come in? No, the, the, this, the party for This Week in Startups is open to anybody. And so... Uh, then I'll be there? Yeah, do me a favor, email, and we'll make sure we get you on the list. Uh, okay, All right. great job. We'll talk to you soon. All right, take All right. care. Cheers. Get great calls. I mean, yeah. And the good thing is they cut these questions out and they make them like their own little YouTube documents so that you can send them to people. 
And the reason I started the show is because I'm answering too many questions from people. Now I can answer it once with the smart people, and I can send them the video clip. Here's right. us discussing <laughs> founder salaries. Sure. Done. You don't have to talk about it again. And you can SEO a page with that on it and do even better. Exactly. <laughs> Make some money here. Um, wow. Two great calls. Uh, I, I really love the two Ask Jasons as opposed to the one. We've been doing one, and just to, we're trying to keep the show to a reasonable length. It's very hard. Uh, let's do the Shark Tank. Let's get right to it. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, Andrew, we have you in the uh, Andrew, we have you in the uh, on the on the phone there. Yes. From the four hundred four. Right. <laughs> Good old ATL. That's uh, sh is that Hot Atlanta? Yep, that's Hot Atlanta. Ah, oh, a little Hot Atlanta in the hi in the hizzy. <laughs> um, okay, so you're calling from Hot Atlanta. Everybody knows the uh, rules of the game. You have sixty seconds to pitch your brilliant idea. There are 480 people uh, in the chat room. It is, uh, this is unprecedented. This is always when you have a money guy on, people will tune in. Uh, it's no, I'm not saying it's not for your brilliant insights or Tyler's, but a money guy, people tune in, and this will be one. always the money. I watch the statistics. The money guys, whoop, whoop, because everybody wants to watch the show before they meet with you. So okay. be careful, because everything you say here will be brought up in investor meetings for the next 10 years. For your, for your fourth decade of investing, yes. this show will haunt you. Okay. So be careful. Everybody's going to be like, can I get 75000 in deferred salary? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to take $2, millions off, $2 million off in the next round. You said one, two. No, but it's only a $3 million round. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to do the Shark Tank. and Not from the round, from other investors buying it after, outside yeah. the round. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no, no, that was coming from you personally, Howard. Uh, DNA mail, DNA mail, everybody loves DNA mail. DNA mail has been a sponsor of the program since episode number one. Uh, they've been with us from the beginning. And if you are a startup company, you do not want to waste your time doing IT. Howard, how many of your CEOs do you want screwing around with an exchange server? Uh, only Zobni. Only Zobni because that's their business. Because <laughs> that's their business. Right. We, we, we outsource our, our exchange. Of first course round. you outsource your exchange. And what, a, what would be a better place to do it than DNA mail, DNA mail, as low as two ninety five a month, free 30-day activation, free activation and setup, free 24-hour support, and 99.99% uptime. We love the guys at DNA mail for sponsoring the show. And uh, they have signed a contract to sponsor the show through 2017. <laughs> These guys love the show. Uh, and they've been tremendous supporters of us. And... Everybody knows that is their Geary, G-I-R-I. We talk about Geary a lot in yep. the show, which is your you know, deep-seated honor and duty to uh, thank the sponsors on your Twitter account. So just thank Ustream, Bing, DNA Mail, and WebSpy and PowerVPS. Um, and we're going to talk about those guys later, WebSpy and PowerVPS. But now we are going to do Shark Tank. I am looking in the chat room. In the chat room, I'm going to ask everybody two numbers from 1 to 10. One, the quality of the pitch. And number two, the quality of the idea, the merit of the actual idea. So you're going to say pitch, colon, a number from 1 to 10. And then you're going to say idea, colon, 1 to 10. Uh, Tyler, you know the rules of the game. You're going to take down a number as well. Howard, you'll take down a number. I'll do a number. And then we're going to give some great feedback. And Andrew, are you ready? I'm ready. Three, two, go. Okay. Other number is a virtual phone system for small businesses and startups. It basically gives you some of the features of the hardware PBX without any of the setup costs or the expense, and you can use it on top of a hardware PBX if you have one. If you have a virtual office, you have a startup with three co-founders that work out of their apartments. You can sound like a bigger company with an office and a receptionist. You can have auto attendant, voicemail. You can have voicemail transcription, uh, all these features you can have. We're working on vertical markets so we can build specialized features just for certain things like real estate uh, and medical so that we can customize our application in a lot of ways to fit people's specific needs. Uh, right now, the pricing plan is uh, $9 a month for a phone number, and you just pay per minute for usage. We're working on uh, new plans that are more of, uh, easy to budget for for larger companies and things like that. Um, it's all virtual. It's all in the cloud. It's based a lot on the Twilio API, which we're a big fan of. Uh, we use a company called MyCaption.com to do the transcription services. They're really fantastic have a great API as well. And we just launched about a month ago. Awesome. Okay. Good job. Um, took exactly 60 seconds. I think I understand what you do. 
let me ask uh, Howard, what did you think of the pitch? How did you rate the pitch? How did you rate the idea? I know it's <coughs> an elevator pitch, yep. so. No, I, I think I think the pitch w was uh, you rate one to ten. Is that the scale yeah. you use? No, I, uh, the pitch was about a nine. Uh, oh, really? It, or eight, uh, maybe an eight. Uh, yeah. It didn't didn't give me market size. It, it, that was one of the big problems. Right. Uh, the idea is about a six and a half because there's so many of them. Right. This has been done many times. Right. It keeps being tried. Uh, the issue is always in how do you reach and market to that small business in an effective way. And mm. that's, that's been the problem. Asterisk is out there in the open source world, obviously, to do yes. a, a lot of these things. So it, it's, a ver it, it's really going to be all about marketing execution, not about technology and all the technical features, because that's pretty widely available. Okay. Uh, so pitch eight, idea six and a half. Looking in the chat room, uh, I see uh, very similar. I see um, pitches six, eight, seven, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those are the pitch numbers. Idea three seven nine six three four four nine uh, six. So it's it's pretty much all over the place. But I would I think you probably got the range correct. Um, yeah, I think I want these type of products. I always you know dream of getting rid of the phone systems that we pay for every month three or four hundred dollars for a Polycom phone. Uh, but they never seem to work as well and hard to set up, et cetera. Um, and it seems to me like a lot of people, startup companies are just like, here is my uh, Google Inbox. So now you're up against Google Inbox and you're up against just a cell phone. Yep. Uh, so how do, you, how do you address these two issues? Um, you know, the, how do you reach the market uh, and then right. the competition? Okay, well, uh, the marketing side, we're, what we're trying to do is not be uh, we started out as a generic platform anybody could use, and you know we're running. What we're running into is exactly that. You know, it's hard to reach uh, generic. Uh, you know, I talked to a guy who owns a, a four warehouses in Texas that does chemical distribution. It's hard to explain to him how it meets his business needs because it's a generic platform with generic features. Uh, but if it's if you talk to a real estate agent who has specific needs and you can build something that's tuned specifically to like the way a real estate agent does their job you can build a product that fits the niche a little better. So that's the approach we're going to take is building uh, vertical integration, uh, working with other companies that have B2B and B2C real estate products, things like that, to build interfaces for them that meet to help flesh out their solutions as well. So it's not just uh, B2C. The other side is, you know, in comparing it to Google Voice, uh, the Google Voice solution works really well for individuals. It's not so great for groups because there's a lot of limitations with Google Voice, you, uh, you can't get toll-free numbers. You can't um, you can't have two Google Voice numbers that both will route calls to the same home phone number, things like that. Um, you know, our system, you can set up groups. You can assign uh, roles and privileges. You can do uh, you know you can do two types of transcription. You can do the automated software transcription. We also do a high-quality transcription with human operators. That's not available with Google Voice. Okay, so, so uh, we're we're trying to make it like a Google Voice for business. Okay, uh, hey Tyler, by the way, I think your keyboard might be coming across your microphone. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so I think you have uh, an idea that you're competing on price, and you're making something super cheap and easier. I don't know that that's a great compelling business right now. Right. I, when you started to say vertical applications, I saw Howard was a little more interested. And I was a little more interested. He said, well, maybe real estate people use the phone differently. Okay, that, that's true. They do use the phone differently. Maybe if you made the software for them, hi, you know, this is Jason. I'm a real estate agent in Brentwood. Click one to hear my prices in the range of two to three, two million and up. Here, you know, two to sure. for homes in two million, three for homes in three million, four for homes in four million. Now you've got a compelling right. thing, you know. Or here's right. my circular. If you're looking at my circular, Please type the number of the thing, and I will give you an overview of the house, and, or whatever. You exactly. know, like this starts to sound interesting to me. Um, right, right. So we also thought about something where you know the, the phone numbers are so cheap to provision in a lot of cases, and uh, because with our system they can be temporary. You know, you can keep it for two weeks, or you can give it for six months. Uh, there's no uh, huge setup fee. There's not a lot of cost to get up and running. So if you had 20 homes on the market in a certain area, you could get a separate phone number for every home. And then you know if somebody calls a certain phone number, they're looking at a certain house. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's features we can add so that they all right now. Yeah. So this has been a good call because now you're getting somewhere. You know, you you with the general product that you pitched us. The reason you got a six because it really doesn't solve some big problem, and it doesn't right. feel like it's some great market. 
But when you start talking about tailoring it, maybe you're making something that people would pay $300 a month for or $200 a month for, I don't know, maybe uh, $1,000 a year for it if, if it's some custom thing mm -hmm. and some tool that works with the MLX, I don't know. Uh, but maybe you could make a new standard or something like that, uh, like some of these people who do paper call stuff. So uh, I think you need to get back in the lab, talk to some customers and get some, uh, some feedback. Tyler, what did you rate it? Great. Uh, on the pitch, I gave it a 7.75, and on idea, I gave it a 7.75. Okay, so you, you felt like it was good, but you're not jumping out of your seat. Right. Uh, would this it, have... It's not... I, I like the, I like the dis kind of disruptive type stuff. But it didn't have a, you know, um, you know, a far out uniqueness quality. You like, oh, I've never heard anything like this before. You know, right. Yeah. So it wasn't game changing, and right. it feels like that area has already been disrupted. So you're basically coming into a disrupted area where Google said, yeah, phone numbers are free, <laughs> and Skype said, yeah, there's no cost to phones, and you're saying I'm going to disrupt a market that's been disrupted. You know, if you come in and say we're going to disrupt the classified business, I'm like too late. That happened <laughs> a decade ago. You know, Craigslist <laughs> has already disrupted it, so you're disrupting, right. you know, an empty pond. Uh, sure. uh, Tyler, you look through 100 plus applications for each Open Angel Forum and you bring me the top 20, 25. Would this have made it into the top 20, 25? Where would it have been on a, in, a, in a typical Open Angel Forum 100? The, what number would this have been? Um, <clears throat> well, what, what he has the potential to be Open Angel Forum pending uh, the, the clients, pending the traction. Right. Okay. If if it, if it can prove himself, you know, in terms of execution, and can prove that there's really a market for whatever his unique differentiations are, then then it's certainly open angel forum contention, you know. Right. So if he if he had market traction, maybe he'd get it based on that. Right. But we don't have market traction here, and we have right. a pretty uh, you know basic idea. I'm not going to diss the idea, but it is a basic idea. Sometimes the basic ideas are the best ones. But uh, I think performance or promise. You know, that, I mean, that's really what investors are looking for. And like, you have, no, you don't have the performance yet, and the promise here is not like so great. So it, it sort of falls flat. So there's some good feedback for you. Get back in the lab. I want to hear you on the program again in two or three months with this real estate vertical thing or something even better. Um, and I'm going to, you, you seem like you're a little low energy. So I'm going to prescribe uh, two viewings of Gladiator. <laughs> with with uh, with a half viewing of Black Hawk Down, basically from right. about 30 minutes in on. So you just skip the first 30 minutes of Black Hawk Down. Right. I basically want you to start Black Hawk Down when they drop in the two snipers. Right. You know the scene when they drop in the two snipers and they basically say, you know what you're asking for. We can't tell you when help's coming. And they say, yeah, drop right. us in anyway. Right. And then there's a thousand <laughs> Somalians around them ready to kill them and they're taking out, you know, 20 at a clip, right. but they've only got a couple of clips left. <laughs> That's the moment you need to think about right now. Okay? All right. All right. Yeah, so take, okay. take your prescription and we'll see you in three months. Thanks. For, thank Cheers. you very much. Okay. You know, some of the entrepreneurs, they don't have the swagger, they don't have the, the oomph. They need to start thinking about killing it and crushing it a little bit more. En energy level. Absolutely. Energy level is critical. It's very critical in, in a pitch. Critical in a pitch? Critical when you walk in the door at your startup. If you're not pumped and you don't have that energy level, when the CEO founder comes into the startup, everybody should go, whoa. Well, that's why it's critical in a pitch, because it says that you'll bring that same energy to the startup. On the daily. Correct. We are, we are in sync, and uh, that leads us to the interview segment, which everybody now, I, I mean, I've sold this pretty, <laughs> pretty well, and there's over 500 people in the chat room. Um, and the interview segment is, of course, brought to you by WebSpy. WebSpy is a great company uh, from down under. And what episode was WebSpy on? I can't remember the episode. You should go back and listen to that episode. It was really good. Uh, pretty inspirational. Uh, and you can monitor all kinds of server activity from employee internet access to mail service to web hosts, analyze traffic levels, patterns, errors, and more. It's a total log analysis solution. And logs pick up activity so you can see things. Uh, but it's not about blocking. It's just about understanding what's going on in your network. You need this kind of stuff as your company grows up. Again, outsource it. You don't need to build this solution yourself. Yeah. And they're not doing what, what my hometown of Lower Marion, Pennsylvania is and looking at the students uh, yes. <laughs> on their Macs. We uh, had that in the news segment last week, yes. and it was bizarre. Yes. And I said immediately, someone's going to jail. Uh, that high school's around the corner from me. They did suspend uh, the, um, the, two people, the two tech people involved. Uh, they're on paid leave right now. This is why privacy, when people talk about privacy and they're like, oh, it'll never happen. No, wrong. IT people. No offense to the IT people watching, but I would say 20% of them are absolutely spying on everything that goes to the network. <laughs> That's just straight up the truth, because I was in the IT business, and I watched an IT guy at Sony 
negotiate with his boss, then proceed to go into his boss's mailbox and look at his boss emailing his boss over the numbers that he wanted, and then go into the negotiation. And we basically yes. <laughs> laughing about them at lunch because he knows what the upper limit of what they can do is. So he just went five thousand dollars above their upper limit, and then they said, "Well, that's the upper limit." And he said, "Oh, we just split it halfway." And they said, "Yes." <laughs> and he basically got a better raise than all of us, all because Lotus Notes didn't encrypt email boxes in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's pretty funny. I mean, but also disturbing, and that same thing's going on across the board. Uh, be careful of that cloud computing. But it is wrong. Just, of course it's wrong, but you know what the other problem is? Technology people don't always know right from wrong. I mean, when you mm -hmm. just look at the landscape, I mean, you watch what Zuckerberg did with privacy over and over again. I mean, you just bang your head against the wall. Like, well, not just privacy, if you read the Silicon Alley Insider, the Alley Insider this morning about their, take, their take on the whole Facebook. Uh, Patent? Yeah, yeah, the fa Facebook creation story. You know, oh, yeah. To, you know, so. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we've gotten into this a little bit, but mm -hmm. the history of the company yeah. feels like a lot of stolen IP. And a lot of people, you know, IP going from one company to another, it, it's It's, it's a pretty murky. complex story. And, uh, you know, regardless of how the lawyers sort it out, if you, when you read as much of the facts as are, are out there, it, it's clear that it, it wasn't the cleanest beginning. No. That would be the most diplomatic way to say it. I've uh, always been noted for my diplomacy. Yeah. Because uh, I love Facebook. Yeah, and it's and a great company. you need company. to be diplomatic. You and don't it's a great, no, it's, it is a great company. And, and I, you know, Sheryl Sandberg's doing a great job of turning that company into a real, real business. Yeah. I just think they may be worship at the 23-year-old's feet a little too much in terms of making decisions. Like, if you bring in adults to sit with them, the, the privacy issues, like, these are pretty bonehead mistakes in terms of, like, we're going to take your behaviors on other sites and syndicate them to everybody else in your network. Like, I really don't want people knowing that I'm going to see the, you know, <laughs> the Little Mermaid or something, you know. Like, mm -hmm. The Beacon was a bit of a disaster. The Beacon was a disaster, although now we're seeing, uh, you know. Blippy. Uh, Blippy. I'm an investor, so. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we're, we, have, we have a, a company in the same kind of space that's in, in, be in South Beta right now. Yeah, so uh, 30 years of investing. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the biggest pass you ever had in your career? I want to start with the most painful question. The most painful you, question. The most painful question you guess. Did you pass on Google? Did you pass on eBay? What was the one investment mm -hmm. you could have been there, could have made a billion dollars with that you passed on? YouTube. 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 Uh, you know, we, we had just uh, decided to invest in Video Egg. Uh-huh. I remember. And we thought that it was a little too competitive and, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, chatted, emailed Josh uh, uh, with YouTube and, mm. you know, really like you guys to come into this one and right. we said you know we, should we do competitive companies that could potentially be competitive they're not exactly competitive right so i think that was probably the the biggest one that's in your recent in memory. my in, in my recent memory right. i go i go further back uh, yeah go go far back uh, go go cuz that back. one would have been let's i could i can tell you how much money you lost <laughs> because you would have been in the first round for yep. 10 million dollars or 5 million of the 10 million it would have gotten you 15, 20, 30 percent of the company, somewhere in that range. Would have been pretty. Yeah, we wouldn't have been in quite that much, but yeah, would have, we so would have, we would have had 10 percent of the company. So you basically six. would have made 160, 160 million. Yeah, pure profit. Which on a seven million dollar fund would have looked pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, question came in from uh, Elroy Z. Why not in competitive companies? We actually we should we should address so that. That's an interesting question, and we've now we've changed our stance on that now, and and part of the reason we've changed our stance. And we do, we will invest in companies that, that uh, can potentially compete, but very cautiously. First of all, we want to make sure that we support the companies we're in. Right. And, and we don't want them to feel that any, in any sense that their IP is going to get shared with the company that's competing with them. What's happened over time, however, is that we've gotten companies that didn't start out competitively that have pivoted and end up competitive. Mm. And what we've done has been fairly open and careful. So we have four partners at first round, and if we have that situation, we kind of wall off between two partners, who's handling one, who's handling the other, uh -huh. and we don't s recirculate all the documents to everybody. Of course, yeah. And so we're, we're a little more we're a little Do more you have one of those in the current portfolio? If I went through the list, would I see something that looks similar? Video Egg and Scan Scout. Okay. Scan Scout started out quite differently. Video uh -huh. Egg started out quite differently. And they both ended up being video ad networks. Hmm. Uh, and they compete. As and video they compete for deals. And they're both doing well, fortunately for us, because it's a very big space. So, uh, so it hasn't been too bad, but I, I'm involved with Video Egg. Chris Freilich's involved with Scan Scout. Mm. We don't talk uh, details of those companies right. with one another. Uh, and it, it is an emotional thing for entrepreneurs, isn't it? Like, mm. I know that if 
Sequoia said we're going to invest in Jimmy Wales and Wikia, I would go ballistic. Mm -hmm. Number one, because I care about them and I wouldn't want to see them lose money on Jimmy Wales. Mm -hmm. But number two... You don't mind if we do since we're in Wikia. Oh, no offense. <laughs> Jimmy Wells and I have a big rivalry. Uh, but, I know, I know. Anyway, they're doing pretty good. I have to give them credit. They did break even. But their search product Gil's, was Gil's a disaster. Great. Yeah. yeah, they're still doing good. Yeah. Jimmy Wells and I have a personal rivalry. <laughs> but we'll leave that as <laughs> leaving that aside. Okay. It becomes, like if Jimmy Wells had to deal with you investing in Mahalo, he yep. would be, wow, yes. Jason's always bad-mouthing me. How could you invest <laughs> in him? Oh, my God. Yes. Uh, it really is because you have to deal with big egos. Part of it's big egos. Uh, and part of it is is the, the the fear that if they're in markets that are too small for two or three great companies, that uh, you know we're, we're you know which one's going to be right. And when we look back, you see the other one of the big things that I didn't invest in, I should have, although from a financial point of view, I'm not so sure. In the end, was TiVo, mm. and uh, Paul Allen at the time invested in both Replay and TiVo, and right. people said, how could he invest in Replay and in TiVo? Right, he's had he had, he had and just the that. answer was he knew that DVRs were coming, and that was the right place to invest. Right, and he didn't feel that he could make the call as to which one was going to succeed. How could uh, Sequoia invest in Yahoo and Google? Mm -hmm. They were, I mean, they, one was search. It didn't seem like they were competitive at the time. Well, and that's the whole point. They pivot yeah. to become directly competitive, and right. that does happen. Uh, so then you could sort of say, it really wasn't our problem. And somebody mentioned in the, in the chat room, Kevin Rose in Foursquare Square and Gowala. Right. You saw that happen. Does that, like, does it feel like it's a... Uh, does it feel like betrayal to the entrepreneurs when that happens? I'm not saying Kevin did this, but is that are they are they I, valid I, in feeling that? Are they valid in feeling like you double crossed me? I don't think so. I mean, I, the the issue is really you learn about a particular area, and you, you know when you know more about it, you can make better, more intelligent investing decisions. Right. And you may say, okay, gee, this is a huge space, location huge. Right. Obviously, for uh, everything we do. In, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to have some location component. Right. We've just invested in Simple Geo to, to provide a platform for a lot of people doing that kind of thing. So, What is Simple Geo? Because, you know, I, I've been hearing about this a lot, the Simple Geo. Uh, what, what is the premise of this company and why did you the, invest in the it? Prem, the premise of Simple Geo is to create a platform in which anyone can send it layers of geo information and they will then make those layers of information available to other people. You can put the limits you want. But you may say, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in geolocated information about people. Mm. Someone else can say, I'm going to put in uh, geolocated information about uh, manhole covers. Mm. Someone else can say, I'm going to put in geolocation information about um, you know, telephone poles. So there's different layers. Completely different sets of information, but all geocoded. And then somebody else can say to Simple Geo, gee, I want to do a map that has manhole covers uh, versus telephone poles in, in, in this, this hun hundred square foot area. Right. And they will pull out the data from the multiple areas. Uh, if, if, he, if one of those layers wants to charge, they'll deal with the, with the payment mechanisms. Ah. But they will be the store, the so backing store. So like an store. API clearinghouse. It's an API clearinghouse and store and storage ah. for, all, for all your geo-based information. So then you do this, they just charge for access to the API, and they split it with the people who are providing the data. There are various business models will yeah. come up, but that's one potential one. And how come nobody has done the business of I put my location to Simple Geo, and Simple Geo sends it to Twitter, Facebook, Gowalla, and Twitter, and Foursquare. Well, you could. I mean, that, you can certainly build that on Simple Geo very easily. Right. You, That's the thing, because I, I own the domain name 20.com, mm -hmm. and it means location yep. on the radio. What's your 20? Yeah, yeah, what's your 20? Yep. If yep. you're in the military or worked on an ambulance. Ham radio operator. Or ham radio operator. So I, I thought this would be a good use of it if you just said 20.com. I paid 75 mm -hmm. grand for this domain. Wow. Uh, right. What was the original name of Mahalo? Yeah. It's a good domain name. I've got yeah. offer 400000 from people in China because they go crazy, 163 right. and all these places over there. Yeah. So the Chinese keep emailing me about it, and I, I keep telling them it's not for sale. But wouldn't that be a cool service if I just went to 20.com and just hit the button, or I just hit the 20.com app, and it would be like posterous to all these other location-based services? You'd invest in that. Uh, you know, it, uh, th it's, it's too easy to do in some sense. Right. So I'm a little worried. That I don't see the business model out of it. Well, like an API business model, and it's the shortest one. So it becomes the standard. But then yeah. you, I guess you become like weblogs, the pinging service. You're, you're like GNIP. We have GNIP, which is, yeah. uh, which is doing Which I that. met with in Boulder. Mm -hmm. Really nice reboot, Yes, by the way. Yeah, they've done a, they've done a great job there. And that's, so that, but that's, they're struggling to, to find value in a world it, where it, you know, everybody can tap into the API. Everybody can. So part of the value is what Nashree's doing in, in licensing APIs. Sure. Uh, but and managing them, it seems. And managing them. Or, or, or even developing? Are they, are they they'll help companies develop the APIs. They'll help them develop web services. Is they'll that one of yours too, Mashable? Yeah, Mashery. Mashery, rather, yeah. yeah. 
Mashable's I, I, the blog. Mashable's the blog, right. <laughs> uh, Sorry to uh, our friends at Mashable. Uh, no, Mashria, of course. Yeah. Uh, and I get contacted by them once in a while, like, oh, hey. Well, but it seems like they help you curate developers, too, and get them they excited. Do a lot, they do a lot of things in, in developing communities and making, telling people that your API is available uh, so that they actually get spread. So it's, it's, it's basically marketing and management of APIs. Yep. Five grand a month or something like that. Whatever. I got pitched five grand. <laughs> okay. I think it's five grand. <laughs> For you, Whatever. five grand a month. For me, five grand. Yeah. Everybody else, maybe it's 10, 15. You know? right. It's like or a PR two, or, firm. Or three. Or three. <laughs> or two. Or maybe I'm getting, maybe they're looking at me going, in case the guy's driving a Tesla, we'll raise the price. <laughs> uh, so Simple Geo, pretty good company. Yeah, you were going to tell us about a company that you passed on previous to YouTube in the early well, days. Well, I said TiVo. TiVo, right. TiVo. TiVo would be very yeah. early, yeah. TiVo would be very early. Back in the really early days, one of my first investments was Franklin Computer, which was doing Apple clones back in yes. 1982. Wow. And I actually am, am still chairman of that company after 28 years. Uh, that company has been on the NASDAQ, it's been on the New York Stock Exchange, it's been on the Amex, and last week we took it private again. Wow. So it's been through a complete set of cycles. It turned into the company doing dictionaries and spell checkers and uh, language products. Wow. And, uh, so it's kind of been through a whole morph. Morphing, but because we invested in Franklin back in, in '82 in, in the clone business, yeah, uh, we we looked at a lot of the companies, and you you, know, you mentioned in your intro bubble issues, yeah. Right? So 1983, the IBM PC had come out in '81. Uh, Apple was doing the 2E. We, yep. we did the Apple clone. Apple sued us, and all sorts of things happened. I remember. Yep. We did some IBM clones. We had a we put a company in business. Uh, in Taiwan called Multitech at the time. They couldn't use that name in the U.S., so, but they were making uh, all the IBM clones that we were selling through Sears. Uh, we decided after the Apple lawsuit we'd get out of the clone business and do the spelling business, so we let him keep that business. He renamed it Acer. It's done okay yeah. <laughs> uh, since then. Uh, but we, we looked at 300 companies that were going to make IBM clones, each one only needing 1% of the market. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's mm. classic bubble. And yeah. so in, 1980, in 1983, late 83, there was a huge collapse in the PC industry. Yeah. There were just so many companies that were making uh, clones and, and trying to, and nobody could get distribution. And in the end, uh, at, at, at that point, it was basically Compaq and Dell. Yeah. All consolidated down. All consolidated down. And then a few other, and then Acer and a few other people came It was in. the race to commoditization. Completely so. Completely the race to commoditization. Um, do you remember... Now, 1983, I was 13 years old. Yeah. <laughs> but I was in 1982 or 83, I got my IBM PC Junior. Mm -hmm. And I was an avid, you know, phone freaker hacker with a 300 board yep. modem. Um, but I've been told the story of the Eagle Computer. Yes. Do you remember Eagle the Computer? Story of Eagle and Computer tell Computer us the Eagle Computer story. The Eagle went public. The founder bought a, I think a Ferrari, but it may have been a Lamborghini. Don't, 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 don't hold me to it. It was a Ferrari. It was a Ferrari. Uh, and unfortunately, killed himself the day of the IPO or the day after, but I think it was the day of, yep. the IPO. And uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the bankers didn't know what to do. <laughs> uh, they basically killed the IPO and, sc and, uh, and scotched it back, and the company was essentially dead. I mean, it took a, took a while for it to yeah. unwind. It was just a horrible thing. He was up here in, uh, in Santa Barbara or someplace nearby. Yeah, uh, and this is always, uh, I think, one of the stories for people when they uh, have success is don't kill yourself <laughs> With toxic wealth, like yes. they, the first thing young people do uh, when they make some money is they get a fast car, and then they attempt to kill themselves. I mean, accidentally, I mean, obviously, <laughs> but they go drive some car way too fast that they shouldn't be driving in the first place, or they get or they get a prop plane, they start flying prop planes around or whatever. And well, they should, pilots. They should. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I'm very fortunate. I have a wife of 42 years who made me give up my pilot's license when we had our kids. And I think she was right to do that. Uh, I recommend, and I have recommended this to CEOs who, who sell, uh, who sold and made the money, that if they want to buy the Ferrari, take Skip Barber first. Right. And then at least have some appreciation for what it means to drive really fast and how to do some of it safely or more right. safely. Yeah. And safely does not mean 101 south right. <laughs> or <Yeah>. north. <laughs> right. So, but anyway, that, but yeah, it's, it, it, it is, it's, it's pretty horrible when that happens. On the other hand, you see people who are much more measured and... and Sort of controlled in what they're doing. I mean, I think the the the, uh, the founders of Google, Larry and Sergey, were much more measured uh, when when that thing went. Yeah. Uh, we obviously Aaron Patzer from uh, Mint has been really you know ca cautious in terms of what, what he's doing with his newfound wealth. Yeah. And so tell us about Mint. Mm -hmm. When did you first meet them? And 
uh, Rob Hayes, uh, our partner in San Francisco, first met with Aaron. We, he loved them. He, we, he asked for all the partners to meet as quickly as possible. I remember sitting in a Starbucks in King of Prussia on a Saturday morning uh, on a two-hour phone call with Aaron. I thought he was terrific. He had a great idea. Yeah. We, we were the first investors. And uh, we helped nurture that company, Rob in particular, all the way along. And you know, he had a better idea. And Intuit realized it was a better idea. Uh, first, Intuit did something kind of silly, which is they sent him this letter, which was on our blogs at the time, saying, you've reported you have a half million users. Don't you know that it's fraud if you make false statements and so on? And uh, it, it was kind of a strange letter from, from Intuit. It's sort of like <laughs> when somebody in high school goes and pulls the pigtails of the girl they like. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it was, it was it's this legal letter from the general counsel trying to, and, and the, the, we didn't kind of respond because the answer was we really did have a half million users at the right, time. Right, he was or just in disbelief. Was. He was just in disbelief. So did you meet them before or after TechCrunch 40? Because I remember they were, they, they basically crushed it at TechCrunch oh, 40. Oh, no, no, we were in way before that. Way before that. In fact, the, 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 one of the things that First Round tries to do is to provide a lot of value to our companies through a network of CEOs. So right. our CEOs get a special, a special group they belong to. When Aaron launched the TechCrunch 40, the, uh, the, his servers were not scaled because it was early beta. Right. They, they were scaled for five or 8,000 people. Uh, at the end of the night, they had 18,000 signups. Wow. The servers started to melt. And so Aaron put a note out on the CEO network saying, does anyone know who this can help? This is what, an email list? This is an email list. It's wow. a Yahoo group, actually. Yahoo group. Uh, and does anyone know who can help me tune my SQL? Hmm. One of the other CEOs sent him Martin's phone number, you know, the CEO of, of MySQL. Wow. He called Martin, it was, who was in Germany at the time. It was 3 a.m. <laughs> Woke up, terrific guy. He said, I understand your problem. Don't, want, don't, don't feel bad. I understand this. Call these guys. They just tuned Facebook's MySQL. Huh. He called them, you know, t and they said, read us your parameter list. He read them the parameter list, made a few changes, and he was back up and running, and they came in the next day to really help tune the thing. Problem solved by the first round network. Right. Now, I was the editor of the ACM database journal when it first came out when I was a professor. But he didn't have to ask a database person about what to do. He asked the network. Crowdsourced yeah. answers, but from a very exclusive crowd. I've heard about this answers uh, phenomenon, yes. It's very powerful, <laughs> isn't, isn't it? Isn't <laughs> it? I think so, you know, it's, you know, somebody could make a business maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and, and that was, of course, a pretty amazing run. Uh, by the time we got to the third tech crunch, was it bought? A year after or two years after? Two years. Two years after, he announces it on the day of TechCrunch, yes. which was a very, I felt, was a very cool thing to do. I really appreciate we, we, we that. We tried to time that, yes. Yeah, and I, uh, I have to get him on the program here. But he, um, that was a really mensch thing to do because it really kicked off the event with a ton of energy. Yeah. Like, my God, $180 <laughs> million or 170 what was it? Whatever was reported, 170 I think. Something, so, like, something like that. Yeah. Um, and so now you invested in that when it, in the angel round or the first round? The angel round. Angel Round. And actually, you named the company First Round, so you basically have, you yeah. are what you say you are. We are what we say, and we continue to invest in subsequent rounds as well. Hmm. Uh, to keep your pro rata share. To keep a reasonable share, yeah, yeah. pro rata or whatever. Yeah. And so, define for the people on the program who don't know what pro rata is, what it is, and how you make a decision if you want to be mm -hmm. pro rata or not. When we invest in a company, one of the rights we tend to get in, in our documents is the right to maintain our percentage ownership after each round. So we get the right to invest. So if you've raised a uh, million dollars uh, in the first round and we now own 10% uh, of your company or 20% of your company, and we now go to raise $5 million, we have the right to buy 20% of that so we can keep our same 20% or a million dollars. Right. Uh, we don't have to, uh, and uh, so we might get diluted down. Uh, so your 20% may get diluted 20%, so you go down to 16% or something right. like that, yeah, or, or, or you have to step up or, and put a million dollars. Or we can step up and put a million dollars, or sometimes we'll say we'd like to take more than our pro rata, which, ah, which happens on the We want to increase our percentage. We want to increase our percentage. Right. That typically happens if we've gotten too little in the first investment, you mm -hmm. know, we have for various reasons. When we invest in a company at first round, we try to set a milestones for what we expect that company to achieve with the, with the CEO and the management team uh, over the course of the initial funding round. And it, our feeling is if we meet those milestones, we are likely to take our pro rata or increase. Hmm. If you don't meet those milestones, we probably won't. Uh, we may not go to zero, but we probably won't do our full And you try rata. to make that clear. We, we are ex very explicit about that because 
it's the way that a seed stage fund has to work. Right. We can't. You can't pro rata every deal. We can't pro rata every deal. We can't. We don't pro rata deals. Some, some later stage funds get into these situations where they drip feed companies for long periods of time. Our view is if it's not going to work, we'd rather fail cheap. And quick. And quick. Because essentially your time is really the most important piece of this puzzle. The money is available in a lot of different places, but mm -hmm. how many companies can you, as an individual, you have four people in your company, but how many do you invest in and then how many boards do you participate in? Well, we have eight investment professionals, the four partners plus three principals and Charlie O'Donnell now in New York yep. as an EIR. So we have eight people doing that. Uh, we also, because we're an early stage fund, we like to be on the board for no more than 18 months. So, and then the later stage VCs come in and as my partner Josh likes to say, we're baby nurses, not babysitters. You have a young baby, right? Yes. You have somebody living with you yes, to help baby take nurse, care of it. Sure. Right? They're 24 hours a day, really, you know. Yes, they specialize. Okay, they specialize. And then, you know, six months later, She'll be gone, and or he, but I assume it's a she, yeah. and uh, and then you'll hire babysitters once a week or twice a yeah. week to come in. Different okay. skill set. Different skill set, and the classic later rest stage VCs are babysitters, which is not pejorative in any sense, but they're there once a week and whatever. We're the baby nurses in that early stage, so we right. figured we'll put our value in in that 18 months, and then provide a lot of value through our infrastructure, the CEO group, and a lot of other things that first round yeah. does. We have a jobs. Uh, Thing. We have 155 jobs on our job wire now. You wow. go to firstround.com slash jobs, you can sign up. We send out a weekly note of sort of the best jobs out so there. So recruiting is, a, is clearly one of the hardest things to do as a startup, and you try to pitch in there. We pitch in a lot there. Yeah. So we pitch in a lot in helping you manage the next round. We have a ah. CRM system for managing your second round. Ah, to so help the companies manage that. Here are the potential company PVCs you could talk to. Here's who you can talk to. Here's, here's who we know at those places. Here's how to make the contacts. All sorts of things. Because we feel that as a firm that's doing a, uh, you know, a, you know, more investments than, than many others, other firms, we need to provide value more than just the partner time. Mm. And, and the money. money right. you know, everyone provides money. It's getting competitive uh, in this you know, angel space. And you got there first. Was, you were one of the first sort of VC angel groups. Mm -hmm. Now it seems like every VC firm is adding this angel component saying, you know, we do angel too <laughs> because they're paranoid that there's going to be no first round. Well, the first round is going to go to the angels. Right. Uh, why has this sea change occurred? It's occurred because the economics uh, of building a business in the internet space in particular has changed so much. When I first met Josh Koppelman, it was 92, and we did a company called Infonautics. Marvin Weinberger was the CEO. It had a product called Homework Helper. And I Homework, this product. Homework Helper, we actually licensed and paid for, or uh, sh revenue shared, all the content from major magazine publishers, book publishers, uh, newspapers. And it's now called ProQuest. It's online. It, it, 45,000 schools use it. But it was originally launched with Prodigy and AOL. It cost us $5 million to get to first product ship. In 98, Josh decided to start Half.com. Ah, Half.com was a huge success. It was a huge success, and I'm fortunate to be a, a part of that as well. Cost us about $2 million to get to first product ship because there were better tools available. Hardware was cheaper, all sorts of things. When Josh left eBay, we helped start a company called Turntide. Cost $750,000 to get to first product ship. Uh, Video Egg, 300000 so the classic VCs that, that wanted to put $2 million minimum to work, the companies don't need it. Mm. And so they're so diluting to a point they don't need it. It's too much pressure. And then if you're given $2 million, you have to sort of spend the $2 million. No VC wants you to see you with you know, right. $1.5 million <laughs> in bonds right. and $500,000 in a checking account. Correct. I mean, so that's been a huge sea change uh, in, 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 the, in the business. The second thing is the economics of the large funds are very hard. If you have a $500 million venture fund, uh, and you want to return 20% to your investors, which is kind per of year. The, uh, on an on a, you know, uh, average uh, annual return, rate of right. return, rate which of is return. what people would like to do. Uh, then after seven years, you need to return uh, th three times that, or about a billion and a half. Right. If you ex assume that you might own 20% of the companies you invest in at, the, at their exit, you need to create seven and a half billion dollars of market cap. If you were in YouTube, Skype, and MySpace, you were halfway there. <laughs> you had to be in all three of them. All right. And then you had to make up the other half. Right. So it became, and, and the statistics have shown that the average venture fund created in the 2000 period has lost money or not returned its money. It's just, it's just very hard at that scale. Right. And, and also, at that scale, it's very hard to have small exits. And those guys who did that, let's be honest here, 
there's a 2% management fee on the money. Mm -hmm. uh, you make a $500 million fund, you're making $10 million a year cash money. That's right. Every year, year in and year out, $10 million for a fund that might have eight employees. 12 mm -hmm. employees. Probably 12. But yeah, still, it's, it's, look, it's very profitable. So each partner is taking down a million dollars in cash a year, $2 million in cash a year? Yeah, probably 750 to a million, depends. Right. Yeah. Just, it's, so it's, a, it's been a business that was fee driven. Uh, when first round started, and still, Josh and I, because uh, we're, we were fortunate in our earlier careers, are actually uh, limited partners as well to a, to a much bigger extent than in most funds. So we, we, we didn't start it as a fee driven business. We started it to make capital gains. Yeah. And, uh, because it, it was mostly your and his money in the beginning. It was not. It was not m largely, but larger than most. Uh, most funds people, are, yeah. The most. I funds. mean, he sold half. dot com, three hundred fifty million dollars. Are you with him? Yes. To eBay. Yeah. And and our, and are a lot of investors, but uh, CMGI and Comcast. Yeah, CMGI. Wow. Talk about yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot, of, a lot of interesting people in there, but uh, and you know that worked out very well for everybody. But the fact is that we didn't want to build a fund that was focused on you know just generating giant fees. And some people fell into that trap. Uh, and look, there are still great funds out there. Sequoia, Kleiner, Benchmark, the people you've named yeah. are great funds. A lot of other smaller funds are great funds too that we work with. And we've worked with, I think, 80, 80 or so funds now. How many investments do you guys have? About 70 active, uh, wow. active portfolio investments. And that's in one fund or is it two it's funds? In, it's in, well, it's, it's in two, we call it two funds. Right. It's a little, our structure is a Because I see the Christmas card you guys do every year is yes. pretty funny and it yeah. just goes on forever now. <laughs> it's It gets to be long, but we, uh, it's uh, yeah, firstround.com slash holiday, I think. It's, yeah. it's a lot of fun if Genius. you haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, people should see it. Uh, but the, the, you're, we're coming back to this from the original question, which is what do we do, how do we support the companies and how yeah. do we handle it? So typically, uh, a partner is going to be on roughly seven or eight companies at any one time. Not that many boards necessarily, because right. on many boards we're observers and not full board members. So you're active with half the companies in the portfolio, let's say. We're very active. Mm -hmm. And then they get to the later stages and somebody else is doing the babies, like you said. Right, but we're still uh, there, you're and still they there. still get the benefits of the network. Yeah. Uh, and you never think about doing second rounds if something comes across the desk and somebody says, well, you know, it's a second round of Gowala or Foursquare, it's really hot, or it's a second round of Twitter, it's hot, a second round of this, uh, it's hot. There's a, there's a phenomenon that the uh, limited partners call style drift. Ah. Somebody starts a, a fund to do seed stage and then suddenly they think they're smart and they start doing A rounds and they think they're smart and they do B rounds mm. and all of a sudden their performance drops because they really were good at seed stage, but they're right. not so good at the other stuff. We stick to our knitting. Our knitting is seed stage. You so guys are good with layups. You're not shooting threes. <laughs> right. Or you're shooting threes, not we're at, we're at we're doing layups and getting blocked. We know what we're good at, and yeah. that's what we try to stay with. And we have discipline. My father told me many years ago that the way to make money in, in this, these kind of markets is buy low, sell high. Right. <laughs> right? And so we buy low. And that yeah. is to say we won't invest in things that with, a, with more than single-digit valuations in our first round. You won't go above... Ten million. Nine yeah, million. Nine, million. Nine, ten million. Yeah. And so we've turned down deals that are gigantic deals today because of that. Just on the bubble. Close, $15 million deal, whatever, $12 million deal. You walk away from it because you want to stay in yeah. that sub-10 yeah. space. Yeah, we want to stay in sub-10. 15, 20. How do you down. source those deals? Because it's, they're sort of underground. It's, is it hard or you know, do you have to just, is it a nonstop hustle for you guys to be getting those small deals? I mean, I know Josh has his blog and he's an epic blogger. You're a great blogger. Mm -hmm. You got Charlie. It seems like this is a, a trend here. I mean, did you bring Charlie on because he's a great blogger and so present? I mean, is that what it takes we, to be operate does. in this? It, to operate in this early space, you have to have visibility. You have to be seen by the entrepreneurs. Mm. And you have to be seen as supportive to the entrepreneurs, which we try mm. to be in every way possible. Yeah. And we also decided when we started, Josh and I felt that we had to be really effective users of the Web 2.0 tools. Huh. So blogging, Twittering, you know, uh, mailing lists, groups, meet communities, ups, whatever. meetups. Uh, we provide events for our companies. We, this week we had the uh, uh, e-commerce event up at shop .org in, in the, during the shop.org conference in San Francisco. We had a dozen of our companies. We brought in 100 e-commerce executives from the top companies to see what our companies could offer them. We've done that in the entertainment world here in, in LA last fall. We've done that in the advertising world. So we, we try to get known so that the early stage community hears about us. And Rob and Kent and Christine in the Bay Area do that. They're out there speaking a lot. They're blogging. They're, we're doing the things that get us known. And we, as a result, end up getting a deal flow to look at 2,500 to 3,000 business plans a year, which is really? an enormous number of things to go 3, through. 3,000 business plans a year, 50, 
50 a week about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 60 a week. 60 a week. 55, 50 a week, yeah. 60 a week. Interestingly enough, I have Tyler looking at 100 every three weeks when he does the Open <laughs> Angel for him. Tyler, you realize that your deal flow is, right now, Tyler's deal flow <laughs> is essentially first rounds. <laughs> this is what it's come to, Tyler. <laughs> well, we, we you know, hope you'll show us some of those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you spent some time with, um, I mean, I could talk to you for, literally, this is like a five-hour show, and it's going to go a little over, so I hope Whatever you don't have is. to be anywhere because I'm not letting you go. Um, you were at Idea Lab. Still I, am. And still are. Idea Lab, an incubator founded by yourself and Bill Gross. Oh, founded by Bill Gross. Founded by Bill Gross. I was the first investor. First investor. Uh, Bill Gross, I believe, one of the most underrated investors' minds in our industry. I, inventive. I, inventive. Inventive, yeah. I Absolutely. mean, if you look at his track record, a lot of the things he invented have just become huge. Mm -hmm. Putting that aside for a second, uh, the incubator space, everybody desired to be an incubator in 1.0. It didn't work out well. In fact, when the incubators became the sort of uh, shiniest object on the block, became the thing everybody wanted to be, everybody came to him obsessed with uh, incubators, boom, we crash. Mm -hmm. Something's going on now where everybody, dog patch, this, that, you know, tech stars, Y Combinator, mm -hmm. not exactly incubators, but incubator-esque, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's, that's the shiny new object. I want to have an incubator again. Deja vu all over again. As uh, Yogi, Berra would, Yogi say. Berra would say, you're sitting here, mm -hmm. you got a little Yogi Berra in you. Is this deja vu all over again or not? I think and it why? Is. I think it is. I think Idea Lab, people misunderstood Idea Lab uh, as an incubator. And they right. misunderstood what incubators, successful one. And Idea Lab has been successful, no the question. The only one from the only, that generation. And probably the only one from that generation. It's successful because the ideas were all internally generated, mostly by Bill, but some by other people, but, uh, and, and honed by Bill and the team. They were internally funded as projects. So Idea Lab could fail very invisibly and very cheap. We did, I'd say, five or 600 projects that we maybe spent between ten dollars and $50,000 on that never became companies. Hmm. But no one ever saw those. At YC, or at, which is a great place, and uh, we think Paul's done some great things, and we've invested in some YC uh, yeah. companies and some Techstars companies, Foodsy from Techstars, Zobni from YC. Yeah. Um, they are really providing inspiration and real estate, but they're not providing all the infrastructure. So at Idea Lab, we had design teams, we had software coding teams, we you had, had server, farms. server farms, we right. had accounting, we had legal, we had finance. Sales. So we really yeah. provide, we're a full service business. It's a corporation, it was structured as a corporation, and we created spin-off companies, which is very different than all the other incubators right. were doing. And I think that's why we were successful. And even as we turned from purely being internet to doing a lot of energy that we've done recently. We have our very successful e-solar, probably these lights. Some of the electrons are coming from our solar farm up in Sierra, California. Wow. Uh, They're going into the grid now in Southern yeah. California Edison. Uh, because we've been able to continue that internally because we still have internally generated ideas. So I think the shiny ones, the dog patches, the so on, they're great. They provide something to the entrepreneurs. They provide, because they're venture run, they're a little bit better than the pure real estate plays, right? which hel are helpful to an entrepreneur, but they're not probably worth as much equity as some of them try to get. Ah, and what, what do you think the equity, what's a fair amount of equity for somebody with just an idea who wants to go and join the Founders Institute or Techstars or Y Combinator? What do you think, if, you, if there was a standard, if you could set the standard, <laughs> wave a magic wand and say, this is what going to the six week or the 10 week mm -hmm. thing is worth, what would you set it at? You know, it's so hard. It's so hard. I, 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 know, I know that they're, they're in the 5 to 6% range yeah. uh, in general. And I think that's fair. I mean, I think... Doesn't it doesn't feel outlandish. It doesn't feel outlandish. It's different than it was when you had you know, Hot Bank and some of the other things and, and uh, CMGI and so on, which were trying to do it and taking much bigger chunks. Yeah, 20%, 30%. 20%. See, in Idea Lab's case, Idea Lab is a founder of the company. Yeah. I mean, right. truly a founder. Right. It's their so, idea. And typically. it's our idea. So we start with 100% of the company. And right. when we dilute the other way. Right. Uh, he, these, comp these places are taking a founder's ideas and trying to help them. Right. So they, a small percentage is about right. Yeah. If it got over 10, maybe it feels... That feels too much. Feels too much. So people can feel pretty safe going there. And good people running them. At least two we mentioned. I mean, Techstars. Techstars, and YC, YC, and Dream It in the Philadelphia area, which... Uh, Dream oh, yeah, Adventures. Dream It? Yeah, it's good? It's good. I don't know yeah. so much about it. Same thing. Hmm. Uh, then 
I remember ideally I'd raise this one billion dollars in cash at a ten billion dollar valuation. Mm -hmm. A billion dollars for ten percent. Right. You personally involved in that. Including investing. Including investing. In that round. In that round. <laughs> Looking at that round, that occurred when? 2000? March of 2000. March of 2000. So you even remember the month. Yeah. Uh, who could ever forget? Who forget? This was the, one of the high water marks of the internet first bubble of, the, of that time. Uh, take us through the closing of that and what was it like the day that you received <laughs> wire transfers for a billion dollars? It's never been done. It had never been done. Uh, I, I should say that we started out trying to raise 300. We started out agreeing internally to sell 10% of Idealab, to, to raise money by selling 10%. Right. The net asset value of Idealab at the time was a little over $3 billion because uh, Overture, GoTo, it was public. Yes. Uh, City Search was public. eToys was public. Uh, so we figured we'd raise $300 million for 10% of the company. Not more, more crazy. I mean, significant, but not, not crazy. outlandish. The demand kept growing. And, you know, like any economically rational uh, player, when the demand grows, you raise the price. Right. That, because we weren't going to change the supply. We were not going to sell more than 10%. Right. There were control issues and all sorts of things. So we're going to sell 10%. The demand kept growing and growing and growing and growing right. to the point where the 10% brought in $1 billion, $30 million. Wow. And, uh, you know, it got, it got to the ridiculous point. Uh, I remember one company called and, and said to our president, you know, we'd love to invest. We want to put uh, some big number in, 50, 100 million, but we need to change a few of the terms. And she said, uh, no, no, we, the terms are all set. There's too many players. I can't do that. And they said, well, we can't invest without this term. And I remember her coming into me and saying, I just turned down you know, $50 million. I've never done that. That's crazy. I remember when yeah. we took your first half million. You know? right. uh, and uh, I said, don't worry about it. You know, we got plenty already. Right. And 20 minutes later, she came back and she said, they're in. That, they just they called back. Wow. <laughs> and that was the bubble. And that right. was a real symbol of the bubble. On the other hand, uh, you know, we did some interesting things. Well, he created essentially the, the value of AdSense, and which yes. was Overture. I mean, he was, he, he was the originator of that idea. Uh, if you, you know, John Patel's uh, book on search is pretty, clear, is pretty clear. But we Bill did create the notion of paid search. And, paid, yeah. pay, and that, that was his idea. And not only that, but in fact, there are enough patents around it that before Google went public, uh, Yahoo had just bought Overture, and Google yep. ended up giving paying a fair amount for those patents, for the rights to those to use those patents. Yeah, uh, in the neighborhood of what at, at the Google IPO was like six hundred million bucks. So right, uh, so that was there was some value gained from that. Yeah, um, and but Bill Bill is brilliant and still brilliant and still inventing still great today, things today. Inventing new great things. things, new things, and we're seeing new new companies. Some in energy, some in robotics, some in the internet space. Uh, we in a bubble. We're not in a bubble now. Are we? I mean, it's hard yeah. to be. It's, 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 how could we be in a bubble if the country's out of work? I mean, this is what I'm. I'm, I'm very confused, and this is why I want to talk to you about specifically what is going on right now. Because I know a lot of affluent people who seem to be making money. There's all these people suffering. There are startup companies who are crushing it. There are startup companies flaming out. There is money being invested, gangbusters. Are we in a recession, depression, a buy? Fricated <laughs> boom and bust cycle concurrently. What is happening in the economy? Explain it. I, as if Clearly, I, you can. As if I could. Yes. As, as if I could. Well, what do you think? Uh, is my happening? my personal feeling is this: we're we're not in a depression. I think that the government acted appropriately and wisely to get to get us out of it. I think that the uh, the banking system and the leveraging of the system was a disaster, and what ca it caused the problems. And if you've read Charlie Munger recently, who's a very wise guy, Warren Buffett's partner, sure, uh, his he he thinks that it, it it's it's touch and go whether we really get out of all this deleveraging, because you had Lehman Brothers and and some of the other big hedge fund players at 100 to one leverage, or 80 to one leverage, and when you have 80 to one leverage and something goes down one percent, one and a quarter percent, you're at zero. Yeah. And so you can't have that kind of leverage in the system. Uh, where the banks are now forced back to kind of rational leverages, which are you know, 10. 10, 10, 10, 15, that's about it. That means they can invest 10 times the money they have in their bank account. Correct. Because uh, not everybody goes and asks for their money at the same time, right. normally. Do you consider it criminal, stupid, um, evil when people did this sort of 80 leverage? 
stupid. I, I don't. I, criminal is, is the wrong word to use, right. but it's stupid. And and I know many people in the hedge fund industry and in the quantitative trading areas and so on, and the smart ones control leverage right. because they know that the volatility of markets uh, and you know Taleb with the black swan theory and so on. Yeah. The markets have much fatter tails than people would expect, and therefore you c if you over leverage, you run the risk of being wiped out. And if you're wiped out, you can't play again and make it back. I mean, so you are knocked out of the tournament. You're out of the tournament, and that's the difference. Now, in the venture world, there's today, no rebuys. <laughs> no more rebuys. No more rebuys, and, that, and that's what's happened to a number of big funds over the last couple of years. Bear Stearns gone. Bear Stearns gone. Lehman Brothers gone. AQR gone. You know, the, a bunch of big hedge funds gone. Uh, you know, some people saw it uh, coming. Paulson, John Paulson, and so on. You know, that betting against it. I certainly didn't see it in terms of the. But I fortunately was not you know, hurt by it. Yeah. But I do think there's a different question, which is our economy ha is changing. And our economy is changing because manufacturing has really been pretty much gone. Yeah. And so we've moved to more service economy. We've moved to more knowledge-based economy. And for the last two decades, we've pretty much had that to ourselves. And now we don't. You've got China, you've got India, you've got the rest of the world. Philippines, Manila, all India. All over the place. I mean, I, I was at, at a company this morning and we we're talking about, we have great teams in, in actually in the Philippines and in, um, where's the other place? Uh, Mexico. And, and, uh, and in both places we're paying dramatically lower rates than we are here for knowledge workers, not right. for factory workers, right. not for seamstresses. You can hire an SEO in Manila. You can, you, you can, can have, hire a copywriter in Manila. You can hire a copy. Yeah, the SEO is one thing, but you can hire a copywriter. <laughs> yeah. You can hire somebody to look, to look, look over designer. stuff. I could make logos from Manila, from India, so from China, you, and you wouldn't know the difference. A wonderful example. Uh, Mike Zisman was a graduate student of mine. He went on to become president of Lotus. When it was sold to IBM, he became a senior executive there. Uh, he's retired recently. He's a big golfer. He decided Scheduling golfing trips with his buddies was complicated. They got eight people, they want to play four courses, they each want to play with certain, all the pairings, uh, and it's an energy programming problem, something he had learned at, in an operations research when he got his PhD with me. So he put out on Rent-A-Coder a bid to say, can somebody write this energy programming algorithm? And for $150, some kid in Bulgaria wrote it. Then he put out for somebody to design a little website to put it on with a UI. In the end, he built a company, it's called Golf Trip Genius, for $10,000. Website, very complex algorithm that runs, by the way, on an EC2 on 100 processors, because it's a really sophisticated algorithm. And if this was done in Web 1.0, it would cost? 10 million. Right. So that's 100x. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's 1,000x. Yes. 1,000x. And, 10 times and 10 times, yeah. It's a 1,000x, and now he is, you know, he, he launched it at the golf, whatever convention they have for those he's things. He's going to sell this company for a million dollars. Well, I, you know, he could, and, or he's having, he's, or having the time of, he's having the time of his life right now. Uh, <laughs> and that, yeah, changes. Changes the economy. The economy is changing. And I think we do need to create and help create jobs. Right. And they're going to be created by And the government startups. can't do that. Jobs are created in startups. The Kauffman yeah. Institute has a lot of studies about all it's that. It's pretty clear. Yeah. Government doesn't make jobs. Yeah. Arrogance key factor in being a great entrepreneur or not. Some people have said the great entrepreneurs have a certain bullishness, arrogance, borderline. <laughs> Fred Wilson blog post recently, yep. ma ma major debate. When you look at the great entrepreneurs you've invested in, is there some correlation between their sort of stubbornness, arrogance, things that people might describe as negative qualities somewhere that make between, them great? Somewhere between self-confidence and arrogance, right? right? I mean, you need self, you need tremendous self-confidence to be an entrepreneur, right? Right. You need tremendous persistence and passion to be an entrepreneur. Um, you don't need arrogance. It just comes with the territory. <laughs> it, yeah, when you have that much self-confidence and that much passion, it's often seen as arrogant, and then sometimes right. it really is arrogance. I mean, and sometimes it's, because, it's not. And sometimes it's not. Right. And yeah, so I don't think it's needed. I've what I've found is that I, CEOs can be either arrogant or not arrogant and successful. What matters then is that they pick a team around them that's compatible with their, so if with they're their style. If, with their style. So if they're particularly arrogant, they need people who can deal with that. Interesting. And if they're particularly nice guys or women, then they need they need teams who will perform well without being pushed by the, which the arrogant people do in a, in a particularly different way. Right. So, so you've got to build the right team around you that fits your personality. Interesting. Uh, greatest entrepreneur 
you've seen in the 80s, 90s, and 2010. Well, and I, you, you can't say Steve Jobs for all three. I, I won't. Well, no, I mean, I, it, it's, it's a little different uh, in that. Steve Jobs, in fact, probably doesn't get it for the 80s for me. No, <laughs> clearly not. Fired from yeah. his own company, terrible market share, yeah. horrible execution. The person who gets it for the 80s is Bill Gates. Uh, hands down. Hands down. Right. Ha hands down. Uh, you know, look, Bill Gross, for me, has, has done so well, and I, I would almost give it to him for the 90s because of the things he created. He would definitely be a sleeper. Uh, definitely a sleeper in there, and I, I, think, I think he fits, fits that model. Right. Uh, Who in, else would be up there for the 90s? Uh, you know that at time frame. Yeah, no, no, I, I do. Um, John uh, Cisco. Um, John Chambers. John Chambers. Clearly, massive yeah. value creation. Massive value creation there. Massive, yeah. not just creation, but uh, capitalized on you know, a lot of other companies in that space. Yeah. Figured out how to really capitalize on it, including a lot of acquisitions, including yeah, building acquisitions like, are and incredible. figuring out how to do that and so, integrating them, and then getting those products right. onto market and making the companies better. I mean, has anybody acquired companies better than that? I don't. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. So, probably there in the nineties. Yeah, John Chambers. Yeah, yeah. And, and in this decade, you know, it, whether it's Sergey, Larry, I don't know. They've done a great job. They've had certainly a, on a pure numbers basis. On a pure numbers basis, they probably they're probably there. Um, I, you know, it's it's hard to see who else. I certainly wouldn't give it to Mark. <laughs> yeah, uh, not yet. <laughs> not yet, of course not. Uh, Bezos. Jeff's great. I love Jeff. I, Where do you I, put him? Because I mean, he's a, quite an enigma in that the, he's done the book thing and the shopping thing, mm -hmm. and then EC two, which felt like a business that he had no business creating, and then he becomes the biggest player in it, and well, then the Kindle becomes the biggest player in that space, which is hardware. Yep. E-commerce. Software, uh, you know, like uh, infrastructure, and then hardware. Well, I mean, he did it well. We sold him Moby Pocket, which did the software for the Kindle. It was yeah. Franklin owned owned that for a while. Uh, I have tremendous respect for Jeff's vision going forward, and I think the the only thing that would stop him from being my in the number one spot is the profitability. Mm. He hasn't the companies he's created have been profitable. I mean, Amazon's been profitable. It's been visionary, but it hasn't been nearly as profitable. As yeah, uh, as a Google or some of the other things there. It feels a little bit like it's his playpen, a little bit. He and, he's, and he keeps building things on top of it. If he just stayed with the knitting, he's a brilliant, yeah. brilliant guy. I mean, he he comes out of the the quant financial world from D. E. Shaw, yeah. And I come out of that with Jim Simons, and and uh, that gives you a way of thinking about the world and modeling the world. And right. Jeff does that well. And now he's doing space as well. I think he's going to do yeah. great there. That'll be a ph phenomenal. Yeah. What is your advice for young entrepreneurs coming into the market today? What should they spend their time obsessing about. Meet somebody, they're coming out of business school or, or they meet you at a Silicon Alley mm -hmm. party and they say, gosh, you know, I, I want to make it big. I have an idea mm -hmm. for a startup. If you could just tell them like, you have five minutes in an elevator and, <laughs> they'll, and they'll actually take the advice. You know, because obviously they're not always going to take the advice. Right. But if you could just say like, give them a five minute speech or a two minute speech and say, no. listen, this is what you have to remember to be successful. What would it be? Uh, well, first of all, hire great people around you. Don't don't uh, don't settle for the people around you, because what what makes companies great are great people. So hire great people. That's first. Secondly, take as as little money as possible in the first six months, and build something, which you can now do. Just the golf trip genius being is one example, so that you can show people a more fleshed out version of your idea. Mm. Don't go too early. Don't come too early. Mm. And then expect to work your ass off. Yeah, <laughs> to have the ex expectation uh, properly calibrated. Let's bring in Lon for the news. It's amazing how the time yeah. People in the chat room are like, this is the greatest interview ever. <laughs> What's the new channel though? Uh, downloads on podcast. 25,000 for a month or two. And we're back, we're back. Lon Harris racing in here. He was getting all cleaned up. He's got his news. He's, he's, he's freshening up. Uh, Tyler, what did you think of the interview segment? Tyler, rate the interview segment. <laughs> no pressure. I, I, it's, it's, I, it's such a treat to see this podcast. Um, Howard gracing the presence of the podcast, I think, is raising the bar on the podcast. So it's uh, between Howard and having Tony next week, it's what, what a mark. treat. We're at a high, it feels like we're at a high... Uh, uh, and the uh, audience, I'm asking them to rate the uh, podcast, and they say, Howard is awesome, 9.5. Uh, <laughs> I can't watch Twist live anymore. It keeps me buzzing and awake all night. That's the idea. 
You have to be indefatigable. That's how they described me in the first piece of press I ever got, indefatigable. And that's always been my word. Indefatigable. indefatigable. That's what I said, indefatigable. Indefatigable. <laughs> that, that's indefatigable. If it's going to be your word, I don't want to correct you. Indefatigable. <laughs> indefatigable. Indefatigable. In other words, indefatigable. Yeah. It, indefatigable. It means the same thing. It means the same thing. You can't indefatigable. be worn down. Yeah. Indefatigable. It's spelled the same, but one of them's correct. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> that, like you said, I'm seeing 10s, 9s, 9.9, 9. Yeah. 9, 9. Thanks uh, for the assist there. You don't work for him. You can correct yeah, Exactly. Uh, Howard, you met me when I was 26 years old. A while back. And, you know, and I was younger, too. Yeah. I was younger, too. Uh, <laughs> tell the audience, I hate to ask a question about myself, but I think they're probably interested. What was it like knowing me during my first... <laughs> iteration as an entrepreneur, what was I like? Manic, and be honest. Manic, as you are today. Okay. No, no difference than that. Manic, uh, I like. Uh, but be honest. No, Pros no, and I, cons. Will, I will be. Uh, you know, uh, opinionated, which mm. you still are, which is uh. good. Those are good, those are good, good, good qualities. Okay. Uh, unforgiving, which is right. a mixed quality. But right, <laughs> right. Uh, but you are. Um, and uh, visionary, I mean, at that time, because we saw, and, and you saw, and, and that there was a new industry being created in Silicon Alley, and you were trying to figure out how to how to do something with it and make yeah. some money with it, and uh, and you did, and and obviously you weren't a pure techie, so you were doing it in the ways you could do it. Yeah, journalism as a writer, as a writer, as a publisher, and so on. It's a pretty vain question, but I just felt like I had to ask it only because I don't remember what I was like anymore. Well, you you don't have that perspective. About I have yourself. no perspective. You feel like the same person you were back then. I'm sure. I don't. I feel like I I, I do and I don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Back then, I think I had I had I was a little bit angry. I wanted to prove that I was part, I, I belonged, because yeah. I did not belong. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like I really had to pr you know, prove that I right, belong. Yeah. And now I feel so much like I am the establishment now just because of the way people treat me, <laughs> mm -hmm. that people come to me and are like, oh, can you help me? Because you know, if I get your help, then everything goes well for me. And I'm like, I fought my ass off to <laughs> just try to get a couple of goddamn meetings in 1996 and nobody would take lunch with me. Yeah. And I don't, I don't forget, I remember the people yeah. who wouldn't have lunch with me and I never forget who they are. I know every one of you. <laughs> I, I just remember like a ma maniacal like, the person that I am, but I always remember that you were all, yes. you and Esther Dyson, I, I told Esther on email, I said, I, what possessed you to ever invite me to your office on a Saturday mm -hmm. to hang out? when I was this little obnoxious kid from Brooklyn trying to do a magazine, and she used to let me come by her office on Saturdays, you know, multiple times. And it would give me all this great advice. Look, what, what, what drives me and has driven me, and I'll let Juan get to the news, but is, um, no, please, go ahead. I was a professor for 15 years. Uh -huh. And when I changed to become a venture capitalist, when I, when I resigned my tenure and all that, my father never could forgive me for resigning my tenure, a lifetime job. Right. Uh, <laughs> It's nurturing young people's great ideas and getting them, helping them make the best of themselves. And that's what Esther tries to do. That's what I've tried to do, whether it's been as a professor with graduate students, whether it's been as a entrepreneur, as a venture capitalist, rather, uh, working with companies. That's what we do. And so when somebody like you comes along with the fire, which is always apparent, right. that's what you want to do. You want to say, let's yeah, make point this in that guy. direction. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, talk about a mission in life. Uh, Lon. It's been a busy news week or not? Uh, th there are some stories. It wasn't uh, maybe the most exciting news week. We've had a couple of really exciting weeks where there was I know, just madness. dramatic big things happening. Yes. Not, not as much of that, but plenty of news. Plenty to talk okay, about. Okay, way to lose the audience. Let's hear the first news story. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one, this one is dramatic. Uh, oh. call, the Call of Duty lawsuit. Jason West and Vince Zampella were the former heads of the Call of Duty Modern Warcraft division at games development studio Infinity Ward. Uh, they were fired this week. They're now suing Activision Blizzard for wrongful termination. They're alleging the company failed to pay them royalties for Modern Warcraft 2, Modern Warfare 2, the first-person shooting juggernaut that has already brought in more than one billion in retail sales. Uh, the co-founders allege that under they were under a contract with Activision. It gave them total, complete control over the direction of the Modern Warfare brand, and that then Activision hired lawyers to investigate them and basically invented an excuse to fire them. Right. Uh, Activision has responded, quote, Activision is disappointed that Mr. Zampella and Mr. West have chosen to file a lawsuit and believe their claims are meritless. Activision remains committed to the Call of Duty franchise, which it owns, and will continue to produce exciting and innovative games for its millions of fans. So what do you think of this move by Activision, and who are you inclined to believe here? That's a tough one. Um, a lot of times, entrepreneurs, if they, now these guys sold the company to them? These guys founded Infinity Awards, sold oh, it to Activision yeah. Blizzard, but so, with a contract that they're saying they got to keep Call of Duty and Modern Warfare as brands. Right. Um, if that's the case, and that is should be well documented, 
uh, you don't do this kind of an acquisition without a well-documented thing. However, all documents are subject to debate mm -hmm. and negotiation. That's why lawyers make a ton of money no matter what happens. Right. And anybody can sue at any time for anything. They don't have to be right. Uh, the Yelp lawsuits, I think, are total junk. Uh, and the reason I think that is because I know the people over there, and I know the product is great, and I know if there were people doing nefarious things, like they're saying, there would be an email trail and a phone call, perhaps, or you know, any piece of evidence. You, know, mm -hmm. you don't have these massive lawsuits and all this stuff if there's not one piece of evidence. Anybody could, trust me, there's tons of journalists calling and recording phone calls, or these bi businesses, if they were being shaken down, would record the phone call and then release it to the public. And that hasn't happened. Therefore, right. if there's no smoking gun, I'm inclined to believe, you know, just in the Yelp situation, that Yelp is a virtuous, great business, and they've built a great community, et cetera. So in this case, I don't know. Um, and uh, it's really interesting. The um, People will a lot of times make gray areas in their contracts with each other and sales. And this is why I hate things like earnouts, because you got to fight to get them. And it's just, people should just, if they're going to buy something, buy it. And this earn-out nonsense is always like, you know, or these caveats. I mean, look at Skype with the, you yeah. know, the licensing, the technology. They still own the primary technology. Just, I wish everybody would stop making these type of, like, if you acquire something, it's yours, and you pay the fee, and you don't pay 60%, 20%, and 20%. I mean, I've been through this with the AOL thing where we had a back end. <laughs> Trust me, it worked out fantastically. However, without getting into details, which I'm not allowed to, you know, it, you, it, it winds up, becoming a process and it's nonsensical you know you bought it just pay the price that everybody agreed on and move on especially if it went well and at, in this case it's gone extremely well for everybody it's the most popular entertainment product ever released mm. call of duty modern Warfare. it's amazing so anyway it, when this when this is much money at stake why wouldn't you start a lawsuit is one definition right. yeah. and <laughs> When there's this much money at stake, why wouldn't you kick the guys out and take their money and take a shot at screwing them? So you, you, can, you can handicap it both ways. We don't have the inside right. information. Yep. We're not there. Howard, what do you think? I, I think you called it exactly right. I mean, uh, the, the earnouts and you know, complexities like control of brands and so on, when you're in the ent entertainment industry, it's always who has, does the director has the final cut? Who, does the studio have the final mm -hmm. cut? You know, I, you have to see exactly the wording of the contract. Define it's, final cut, you yeah, know? Yeah, exactly what it says. Yeah, the, it's a bit of a disaster. Very, very complicated situation. I tried to sort of lay it all out, and uh, we don't have enough time in the show, even with the extended uh, running time, to yeah. cover all, all the But I will say, fantastic game. I'm amazing. Mm -hmm. I played the scenarios on the... I got the Xbox just for that. Mm -hmm. Xbox, wonderful product. I'm a big fan. You know what else is a wonderful product? Power VPS. That yes, is yes, Power product. VPS. Power VPS products, <laughs> fully managed virtual private hosting, and they are the sponsor of This Week in Startups. Uh, great customer service, an amazing price, as low as $59 a month. Cloud computing, uh, you know you love it, powervps.com. Twist viewers get 25% off for the life of the plan if they use mm. the discount code TWIST. Yes, yes, Power VPS. Uh, go check them out and thank Bing, at Bing, at DNA Mail, at WebSpy, at Power VPS, and at Ustream TV. Thank them for sponsoring the show on Twitter. They love to see you thank them. Uh, and you can do that if you listen to us on the podcast. Just pull over to the side of the road, or don't, <laughs> and tweet those you know, five uh, handles. Uh, if you're in LA, you're stopped anyway. You can yeah, if you're, tweet if you're stopped in the 405. I checked in on the 405 and at the 405 and the 10. Mm -hmm. I created a stop on the 405, because I was literally stopped. Yeah. It was literally stopped. So I put the car in park. I had enough time <laughs> to create 405 and 10 on the 10 ramp. Mm -hmm. Now, every time I drive by the 405 and the 10, like I, when I'm in you the car. The you're the mayor now. I, no, I'm driving by Lakovala, <laughs> and it's like 400 yards away, 300 yards away, and I'm trying to check in, and I, and I was able to do it again today. I checked in on the 405 and 10 exchange. This is so genius. Uh, but thank you to Power VPS. What a, what a bunch of great guys. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Bing, another sponsor. Hi. We have a new story about Bing. Bing, Bing, Bing. Microsoft gained 400,000 fans in a single day this week by placing an ad inside Farmville. Farmville players saw Huzzah. a message telling them to befriend Bing. Bing's fan page in exchange for farm cash. The Bing page then would suggest users search Bing for the term Farmville animals to demonstrate how the search engine This can is why we you. got all that traffic on Mahalo. Yes, I mm -hmm. thought of that too. Uh, the Bing search for Farmville animals was featured. 400,000 people got <laughs> wow. uh, to look at that search result. And it was the intention was to demonstrate that you can use Bing to do better on Farmville, to get tips, to get tricks, to get cheats. Uh, so is this a way to gain a quality, engaged audience, or is this just 
giving away money with a click, and it's a bunch of way to get people who aren't really uh, that This engaged. is a way, uh, pull up my laptop, please. This is a way to get people to uh, get a nice Bing search. There we go. And a nice Mahalo link yeah. and send us some traffic. Thank you, Bing. <laughs> and look at this beautiful page. Oh, all the facts about the farm bill, how to make money, nice, storage, Nice, plowing. extensive page Oh, there. good long page. It's high quality, huh? Yes. No spam there, Aaron Wall, <laughs> busting my chops nonstop. One of our, one of our best uh, vertical managers is actually on top uh, of this page. And I, I get the Farmville cheat there. codes on Mahalo. I never talk about Mahalo on the program, but you can get the Farmville cheat codes. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a great idea. Uh, these casual games mm -hmm. are big business. Massive. And... There are people playing these on a global basis. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody told me a story of, uh, at the Open Angel Forum last night, they were in India uh, visiting a coconut farm. And they talked to the guys and said they were from Facebook. And the guy says, I play Farmville every night. <laughs> and they looked at each other and said, we're in India at a coconut farm. <laughs> and the farmer Farmville. Play, farms for 12 hours and then goes at night and plays three hours of Farmville. That's amazing. Which is a pretty amazing story. That is. Uh, Mark Pincus is a genius. Uh, I am an idiot because I had a chance to invest in this company in the angel round. Oh, wow. And I didn't. Farmville. Now you know why I'm an angel. No, well, <laughs> Zynga. Zynga, Zynga, Zynga. Zynga. Company. Zynga. Right, but uh, it's the company. He's awesome. And he also got a bad rap this week for like not donating all the money to Haiti when he did. He did it's, donate all the money to Haiti. I know. Yeah. And then people are trying to make trouble because yeah. what happened was like a year ago, they had done a Haiti thing where they um, uh, said, you know, oh, if you buy these things, you know, this go to, goes to a Haiti school. This is before mm -hmm. the earthquake. Right. So the guy from the earthquake was like, oh, back when, before the earthquake, you did a thing where you said very clearly, if you buy seeds, half the money goes to Haiti. And you're like, okay. I'm like, so I, I, I'm talking to Mark Pinkus. I'm like, Mark, you have to get a thick skin, get used to it. No good deed goes on to punish. The more nice <laughs> things you do in the world, mm -hmm. the more haters will come out of the woodwork and try to go after it. Um, there is going to be a major marketing opportunity to your question yes. inside of casual games. Just like there is in-game advertising, just like there are, you know, you go see the Italian job and it's the Mini Cooper. I mean, right, I, yeah. I, I, that movie, I consider the Mini Cooper movie. Right, yeah. You know, I got my Mini Cooper out to that movie. They're, they're driving downstairs with Mini Cooper. I want a Mini Cooper. Well, this is the equivalent. If 75 million people are playing Farmville every month, somebody could actually launch a car brand inside of it. The, just the way the Mini Cooper was launched inside of the Italian job or yeah. BMWs have been launched inside of the James Bond, Bond movies. Films, yeah. Um, there's a huge, huge opportunity here. Who is typing on their keyboard? Sorry. Tyler. <laughs> Zero insights from Tyler today, and he's chatting away with his girlfriend, I'm sure, on Skype during the program, and we hear, we hear that chitter-chatter of little keys. And Tyler didn't even show up for the program today. Zero insights, Tyler. What happened? The, show, the show's not over yet. Keep going. All right. All right. It must be tough. Long distance insights are not Long easy. distance insights are hard Long to get the rhythm yeah. of the program, but we do yeah. appreciate Tyler here disrupting the program with the keyboard. With the keyboard. Uh, keep going. Okay, we got some phone stories to talk about, so let's move into that. Uh, Gizmo Did you have any thoughts on this with the, oh. with the, with the farm bill? Oh, I, I think. Uh, are you an investor? We're not an investor. I mean, I actually, not directly. I, not directly. I, indirectly, one of, one of the funds I'm in is an investor. But the, uh, the fact is that. Giving out free samples and and they, which cost the company money to send you a free sample is mm -hmm. a long honored tradition in marketing. And whether the free samples of a search and they pay you a, a Farmville credit or whether they send you a bar of soap, I mean it's the same mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, true. I'm waiting for somebody to launch a very large product in t inside of a casual game. And people have, I mean, I there mean, was a time when people yeah. didn't didn't even conceive of launching a product on the web. And now that's just de rigueur, you know? Right. Like, oh, I'm gonna launch something well, huge. Well, Second Life had some uh, tentative product launches uh, yeah. early on, but they were yeah. kind of, it wasn't. I don't perfect. understand the Second Life thing, but I mean, Farmville <laughs> yeah. is basically a better version of it. Right, well Easier to use, it's flash-based, you don't have to download clients. client. I think that the key there is, there's, it's a game. There's a point. Yes. Like Second Life, you go yes. in no and point. you're like, what am I doing here? Right. Yeah. I'm wandering around. I can't yeah. believe all the people using <laughs> I mean, I, I had to hide Farmville on my Facebook. Oh, it's <laughs> oh, totally overwhelming. And I think the interesting thing is it sort of sold people on the idea of the social network casual game. Now that that one's huge, it filters down. There's Fishville and Fashionista. Yeah, yeah. No, I can guarantee you that Zynga is as big a company I think as Facebook because I think Zynga has those those games have become franchises in the way Call mm -hmm. of Duty has, right. and I think Facebook has a chance to become faddish like MySpace did or Friend Friend Feed did, or yeah. you know how people move from social network to social network. So I see more risk in Facebook, even though Facebook is worth more certainly now. I see more risk in that than Zynga going global and having Farmville in every single place on the planet because these games translate to every mm -hmm. place on the planet. Sure, it's absolutely conceivable that 300 million people would be playing Farmville. 
a large portion of uh, Facebook's revenue is coming from casual games. What percentage do you think is coming and related to casual games? I uh, don't know. Yes. Half, a third? A third, certainly. I would certainly. say, yeah. I mean, we're certainly talking significant, significant double digits. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm guessing third to half. That sounds reasonable. Yeah. And when, they're, when this coin start co flowing through, it's going to yeah. be really significant. Keep going. Uh, okay, so Gizmodo obtained leaked Microsoft documents and photographs confirming the existence of Microsoft's, quote, Project Pink phone line uh, aimed specifically at teenagers. It's being talked about as maybe sort of a replacement of the sidekick. Uh, the phones are called, for now, these are code names, the Turtle, which is a vertical slider, and the Pure, which is a horizontal slider. They're going to have Verizon as their launch partner and potentially as their exclusive carrier. Uh, the documents also indicate the phone will focus on social networking functionality and that there may be some kind of app store. Uh, and the interface is going to be similar but not identical to Windows Phone 7, which, of course, they announced just about which a month ago. Which is very Zune-like. Here's a picture of it on my laptop. Yeah, you can like, take a look at the uh, uh, photo. If it comes up, clamshell. What do they, what do they call that what women used to do with, a, with the makeup? Oh, they right, would pop it yeah. open and do their with the mirror in it. Compact, compact, compact. 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 Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so anyway, this is uh, maybe like I said, an attempt to uh, do the new sidekick. Microsoft obviously has other phones coming out with the Windows Phone Seven platform. So what's the strategy here with releasing all these different phones at once? Uh, do you think this is Microsoft like a real significant new direction for them? Or are they just aping Apple and Google and getting into hardware? Okay, uh, Microsoft Mobile has been a disaster. It, it, and I talked to people at Microsoft, and they said, and I said, this is what I said to somebody at Microsoft, a very senior person. I said, why is Xbox brilliant? Bing is brilliant. The Zune, the Zune 2 is certainly brilliant. You have all these brilliant products now, and you can't make a decent operating system for phones. I mean, why is Windows Mobile suck so much? And he says, well, think about it, Jason. Why do you think it sucks so much? And I said, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you the question. <laughs> he said, well, what's different about that than the other products? I've thought about it for a while, and I said, those other products don't have 30 years of operating system that they have to support, and this product does. And he said, bingo. We are trying to support a 30-year legacy inside that Windows phone. It's not working. Right. Other people are starting from scratch. We have to start from scratch. Starting from scratch and having a soup-to-nuts hardware software solution is the only way to make a competitive product with somebody like Apple. That's why Nexus One came out. This is their answer to that Nexus One, mm -hmm. is to try to just get, and Windows, the new Windows Mobile, I think, mm -hmm. is more Zune-like from the bottom up. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what it looks and like. And you're not going to be running Office on it, basically. And if you are, <laughs> it's going to be some sort of new Office. And I don't know who the hell's running Office on their phone. Mm -hmm. I'm not running mm -hmm. Office on my phone. I mean, uh, I'm barely really looking <laughs> at a PDF on my phone. Rarely I mean, do you need Excel on your phone. Yeah, no, I'm not doing a PowerPoint off my phone. No. So, uh, I think it's brilliant, and I would not underestimate Microsoft because if you look at the Xbox, it came in there and kicked PlayStation in the ass, and that's Sony, yeah. which is no baloney. Rhymes with Ramzoni. <laughs> what do you think, Howard? Uh, Windows Mobile Seven. Uh, uh, Joe Belfilio showed some of the stuff. Uh, it's really exciting because it's a completely different model. They did not stick with the legacy stuff, and they did not ape the iPhone or, or the Nexus, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they are doing it as a sort of uh, data-centric as opposed to, to application-centric uh, interface. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting. Quite interesting. So my photos, my pictures, my videos, my Very Zoom-like. I love my Zoom HD. The, the Zoom, Zoom HD is beautiful. It's, it's, I, it's stunning. A, it's stunning, the, 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 and the interface works really nicely. And yeah. So I, I'm, I have Gorgeous some screen. better hopes for, for, uh, for the Windows Mobile Why setup. it doesn't work on Mac, I don't understand. When is the Zoom for Mac software going to come out, if ever? That was my question. Apple, Apple doesn't oh, want to release the sync software for syncing with Even iTunes. Even not syncing, but I have the Double Helix stuff. Do you have Double yeah, Helix? Yeah. That's the company I wanted to invest in. <laughs> but then what they raise venture capital, those guys. But that, it's sort of like hacking software. That's from yeah. DVD John. A little bit, but Would it you was invest amazing. in like a Double Helix type thing where it's got a risk of hacking? We try not to. Try not to. Is right. it in your charter with your LPs to not do stuff like that? No, or? no. But, but you just you don't want to be in illegal fights. The uh, you, you you want to avoid as Warren Buffett says you want to avoid being on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> I like that. Avoid yes. Usually yeah. you don't want to pull a Napster. Yeah. Uh, but I see people in the chat room. Zoom HD is wonderful. Yes. Xbox ridiculously great. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the the Xbox is one of the best tech I purchases I've made. In the years, Xbox feels like an Apple product or like mm -hmm. something even better than an Apple product. It's a little personality and it's just. It's so blown out and tight and gorgeous. On when you put it on like a nice screen, yeah, it looks like amazing. the screen we got out here. Yeah. It's just like wow, this is so gorgeous. Where's this been all my life? And it's a Microsoft <laughs> product. I know. You know, like this is the peop same people who make you know Word. 
which is clunky now and too many features. Yeah, it's not it's not buggy. It runs no really bugs, clean. No bugs, no clunk. The nothing. live interface. Yeah, the really red eye of death. Whatever. I've actually I've had my Xbox for years now. I've, I've never, never had, had a red, red eye ring of death. Of death yeah, I don't know. Red ring of death. Who knows? Never. Okay, keep going. All right. Uh, so speaking of Sony, uh, they also are moving into the phone market. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reported Sony is planning a PlayStation portable phone, a long rumored and mythical device <laughs> that would unite the company's PlayStation network. PSP and Sony Ericsson divisions. There's also some discussion in the article about a potential future device that may be aimed uh, to compete with the iPad, a gadget that, quote, blurs distinctions among a netbook, an e-reader, and a PSP. Yeah. So clearly for gamers, this would be a very hot item. But do you think it has like a wide appeal to a mass audience? And if not, what would be the killer feature they would need in order to hit the mainstream with this? That's a good question. I do what I can. Yeah. What would they need to hit the mainstream? Because it seems like, I mean, obviously, I know people who have PSPs and love them and swear by them, and they would all want yeah, a PSP. Yeah, those phone. games are not casual games. Though. But right, those are you have to be a gamer kind yeah. of for that. To I mean, that's like a race car game or a fighting game. It's for kids. I it's like boys. video games, but I can't imagine myself really yeah. wanting to go and get a PSP that was a phone. I, I think it has to have something to do with connectivity and applications. So mm -hmm. if it supported Nexus One, oh, if it supported Android. Sony using the Android operating system, like their hardware, plus, you know, mm -hmm. tweaking that cool. software yeah. could be an interesting thing. I, I don't know if they would ever use somebody else's operating system or something. Right. I mean, they did have Windows on all their machines, so. No, I don't see why they wouldn't. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I think the e-reader uh, is is a place to go. That because I've been a user of the Sony e-readers before the Kindle, mm -hmm. and then, you know, and if they made a did a good job of that, they've done a sort of mediocre job of the. The way the stores and stuff work yeah, compared right. to what Amazon did, but they fixed that. that then, then you yeah, have the e-readers, a pretty elegant device. I don't know. It's like uh, Sony is so out of people's consciousness that there's a young generation that I don't think thinks about them too much. Yeah, that's definitely true. When I was younger, Sony was like the br the of elite course. brand. I yes. mean, if you were buying a TV, this best one was the. Sony. That was their greatest triumph: is that they were able to take their brand and make it mean something in an industry that was completely commoditized. You could buy mm -hmm. super cheap Walkmans, but people would pay triple for a the Sony. Sony one, yeah. Sound familiar? <laughs> it's Apple. It's Apple, yeah. Yeah, and that's why people have always you know, said Apple may buy Sony, but what's the point? Unless mm -hmm. they want to get the Japanese market. I mean, it's still like that in Japan. People look at the Apple yeah. products and they're like, eh. But they look at the Sony products and they're like, oh, you know, mini disc mm -hmm. right. was the greatest idea they ever had. And it would have worked so well if they had just made it connected and made it uh, easy to use as a hard drive and you yeah. know yep. and they and they sort of crippled it if they had let you copy things easier oh, and connect them to each other the mini disc was a, a <coughs> groundbreaking device so many years ahead of time yeah it seemed poised to really change everything if they had just made that into the usb drive of you know yeah. that time and let you plug it in and just freely move data people would have replaced floppies but you could have put multiple movies on it yeah. and i mean they, and they started selling it for movies right unfortunately sony yeah. Makes movies and and music, and that's why the, the <laughs> they basically have to cripple, have their, to own cripple their own devices. Their own devices yeah. for that, which reason. is this yeah. insanity. And yeah. I, I don't think people to get people to take a crippled device, you really have to produce something that is inc of incredible value. And I don't think Sony provides something of such incredible value mm -hmm. that they can provide a crippled device. Mm -hmm. Apple provides enough value that they can cripple the device. No USB port on your iPad. iPad. It feels like ah, but it's beautiful. I'll take it. You know, like <laughs> right. I won't, but I will <laughs> buy one just to play with it. But I mean, <laughs> could not segue into my next story any better than that. Uh, Apple has set a release date for the hotly anticipated iPad tablet. The Wi-Fi only version will be available on April third. Uh, the model boasting both Wi-Fi and 3G access will hit stores in late April. No set date yet. Hmm. Uh, Pre-orders begin on March twelfth. Yep. The 3G data plan is going to be fifteen dollars for two hundred fifty megabytes. 30 for unlimited data. Uh, the iPads themselves start at 500 for the 16 gigabyte Wi-Fi only version. Uh, so my question was, are you still planning on buying an iPad, uh, it, provided Apple doesn't send you one for free, and predictions as to what the launch numbers are going to look like? Well, uh, the one I've been playing with, the beta one that Steve right. Jobs gave me. But that's me, the next level. That's, that's the, the, the 2.0. So yeah, yeah I'll, I'll absolutely go back and get a 1.0 <laughs> version of it to see what they, the other version that the, you know, the peons are going to be using. Right. Um, I, of course, I'm going to buy one, but I buy one of everything because that's my job to be up in this technology. Right. I don't think it's going to. I don't. Certainly, the one without the 3G is not going to be a big seller. It's too expensive, so I do not predict it to be a runaway success. Uh, they may it may be sold out, but I, that may be because they don't build that many. It's not going to be a runaway success mm -hmm. because 
it's way too expensive. Six, seven, eight hundred dollars, which is really what it cost. Uh, and the life of it, you can't buy the fifteen dollar plan. You got to buy the thirty. So you talk about three hundred sixty dollars a year. Three years is a thousand dollars. So the life, this is a thirteen. This is a sixteen hundred dollars, seventeen hundred dollar cost over three years. Mm-hmm. That's laptop level cost. Yeah. You you could buy a netbook. You could buy a laptop, even an Apple laptop, and have money left over. You know, it's just way too expensive for the masses. In a recession like this, I just don't see people doing it. They would much rather have the iPhone. So maybe people will look at this and play with it and go, you know what, I need to get an iPhone. But I, it, it doesn't replace anything. It's, it's additive. So mm-hmm. I'm certainly going to keep it in my uh, – I predict this is what's going to happen. I'm going to buy one. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put it in my uh, living room where I have my laptop. I keep my, keep my laptop in the living room. I'll be hanging out with my daughter. I'll be watching the Nick game. She gets to bed. I take out my laptop. I do work while I'm watching the Nick game. For a, a week or two, I will screw around with the <laughs> thing, right. and then I'll say, you know what? I need to type. I need to write a sentence, and uh, this stupid goddamn keyboard is not going to work. Yeah. So it doesn't work for sending email. It's never going to work for sending email, which makes it a waste of a device. And it's not so difficult for me to open up my laptop. Yeah, that's really that's the it's, action I mean, that that's, saves you. This is what it's saving me, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm not going to sit there watching the Nick game and hold it here like a dork. I mean, oh. it's and it's also heavy. Yeah, it's it's a little cumbersome the design. I, I don't, you know what? I'm yeah. not. I know this is Steve Jobs' distortion reality field, but this mm-hmm. didn't work on me this time. Mm-hmm. I saw right through it, and without a USB port, I just sort of feel like it's almost like he's punking the entire world. Like <laughs> I'm going to give you a device without a USB port. You know? Yeah. It's mm-hmm. just obnoxious. I mean, what do you think of the uh, product? To me, it's uh, it's a uh, five or six hundred dollar Kindle, because the only application I can see making sense on it is yeah. is reading. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some interesting uh, proposals for applications, interesting applications, particularly for young kids, to use uh, you know I- iPads for uh, putting kids' books on it, where you can you can talk. It'll read to the kids. Maybe it'll read to the kids in your voice. Parts of it, uh, all sorts of interesting stuff, for really young kids who don't need keyboards. For me, I, you know, I I need a keyboard. I'm with you, yeah. and yeah. I have a three pound, you know, a two point nine pound uh, X three hundred that I use. Right, lighter than air. What is the that? Mac, li- the Lenovo. It's lighter than uh. the Mac Air. Oh, is it lighter? It's lighter than the Mac Air with wow. a DVD in it and all the por- and all the connectors I have the on Mac it. Air. I like it. And so on. Well, well, I'm going to go back to Windows 7 because what I hear it's pretty tight. So I'm Windows gonna... 7 is great. The Mac Air is thinner than the Lenovo, uh, uh-huh. but it but is. But the Lenovo battery is probably eight hours. The battery is, is six. That's I get six thing. hours, and, and I have, you can and change I have the, the battery. Built, I have the built-in DVD. I can change the battery. All sorts of things. You're allowed to change your own battery. Strangely enough, you amazing. are amazing. Amazing. What an amazing innovation yes. from Lenovo. And you don't have to get a new machine when the battery fails. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, I don't have to bring it there and then have the, the yeah. genius bar? The genius bar, Tell me yeah. what a schmuck I am for not being able to change my battery. I mean, <laughs> what Steve, yeah. I mean honestly, when you see what Steve Jobs has done in closing ba- the, the battery thing, the closed app store, the censorship, you know, the anti-competitive stuff with the browser and the, and the Google and phone. Flash. And Flash, I mean, do you look at that as somebody who's been a technologist for 40 years and has just made you, like, absolutely, totally depressed about, you know, guys like you coming out of the 60s and 70s, like, wasn't the technology about freeing people and enabling them? And And does he feel like a sellout to you, closing it all down for himself and his own greed? He does. And I don't know about a sellout, but it's, it's astonishing that somebody who wanted to be so open was so close. Now, we fought heavily in that. If, If he had let Franklin... We started make our Apple II clones. Apple might have been the IBM and, and Microsoft because they would have had everybody cloning it, and they would have had they would yes. have understood that it was software. But he was so focused on controlling the entire experience mm. that he didn't see that opportunity. Now he hasn't done badly, mind you. No, <laughs> he's done great. Doing all right. Yeah. You know, and the, and his his particular aesthetic is so fantastic. But what happens to Apple after Steve? I don't know. Right, and might does not make right. You've uh, have you ever negotiated or done sort of business stuff with Steve? Yes. But directly. Yes. Way back. Way back. Really, in the same room with the guy. Yeah. What was he like back in the day? I don't know. The reality distorts. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Take me back to a meeting with him. What He's was it very, like in the eighties? If you know, if you know Bill Gates, uh, you know you've met Bill Gates yeah, a number of times. times. Uh, the, the intensity level. That Bill had in the 80s, he's a little more relaxed today. Yeah. And that Steve had in the 80s were unmatched by almost any other human beings I've ever met. And the two of them were similar to that. The focus and intensity and the feeling that, and that's why they say reality distortion. Not reality distortion, it's that nothing else, 
all the air got sucked up, right? And, yes. And that, that's really what was happening. And, uh, and the classic thing you tell a salesperson is, right, you know, never take rejection. Turn rejection into objection, mm -hmm. and then fight the objection. So don't just let somebody say no. You say, why? They say, because A. You say, yes. well, oh, we can do not A. Right. You know, so, <laughs> so, and that, that was step Steve. You cannot, you know, he, he will force you to a logical conclusion that's his. And so right. will Bill Gates. Right. They'll and just steamroll you, basically. Yeah. Well, yeah. With the power of their intellect. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> Smart guy, too. Uh, perhaps, yeah. Uh, interesting. And it's interesting how Gates is mellowed. I do agree with you. He's like, and, he, and he's a blogger now. Yes. Which I find pretty comical. I keep <laughs> texting him. Uh, not texting him. I don't know Bill Gates is Steve. I keep um, Twittering him back or Facebook. Him, well, right. we're Facebook friends, so I keep Facebooking oh, him. Wow. Um, well, I don't know. Actually, maybe I'm a fan, actually. I think maybe I'm a fan. No. Um, because I don't think he has a, fa a regular, if he regular. does, I'm, Personal yeah. account. But I don't know. I've been seeing his stuff for a long time, so I don't know. Maybe I am on his personal page. Good but anyway, I keep commenting back to him, like, I love the fact that you're a blogger now. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's a good blogger. Yep. And he's a photo blogger, too. And he's hanging Twitter. out at Sundance. He's dancing. You I know, love he's it. He's having a good time. I love it. Love it. It's great. It's great. <laughs> okay. okay, final story. Final story. Well, let's see. I'll, I'll give you your choice. We can talk more about Yelp. We can talk about Slide. We can talk about Posturus. Or we can talk about a brand new startup called Fiverr that I thought was kind of funny. Howard, you're the guest. I Any always like to hear about company? new startups. No, none of them. We have we have Rocky that competes with Slide. Uh -huh. uh, I, I like Posturus, but I'm not. We didn't invest in that. Yeah. We'll uh, talk about the new one. Talk we'll about the new one. Talk about the new one. Talk I like Fiverr. The new stuff. Yeah. Fiverr is a job board aimed at small tasks priced at five dollars. Users log in and can request work, and then they pay five dollars up front, or they can offer their services for five dollars and see if they have any takers. Examples would be: I'll make an Avatar movie portrait based on your picture, or I will help you pimp out your PSP, or mm -hmm. I will give you advice mm -hmm. on this project you want to do for five bucks. Tasks are divided into categories, includes funny and bizarre, silly, writing, tips and advice. Uh, the idea is you may not get your task done the way you want it, but even if you don't, <laughs> it only costs you five bucks. Task performers also get rated, so over time you'll know, you know better than to hire somebody who got a bad rating. Uh, the one catch is the site actually takes a dollar out of the five dollars users are paid. Right, 20%. So it's really... The big. Yeah, so it's more like four if you uh, want to be totally yeah. accurate. If you're uh, selling, it's if four. you're if you're if you're if it's you're paying the the money, it doesn't matter. But if but you're receiving the money, yeah, you only you get four of your five. Uh, so what do you think? Do you think this is a good deal for users? And can you think of a lot of stuff you'd want to get done for five bucks? Yeah, um, I do believe foot, foot, in foot long, foot long uh, hero. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Make me a foot long hero. Exactly. I'll take a ham sandwich. That's what um, I thought. It's funny. And clever, and the internet does reward funny and clever and mm -hmm. unique. So it does have that. Like half was unique and clever, half the price yep. for your thing. So yeah. like the, the internet does reward that. The first thing I thought of when I heard Fiverr was half. Um, and Mechanical Turk is very cumbersome and you know right. This is detail, and this is very simple. And if you look, so it's two R's. F I V E R R is how you get there. Uh -huh. uh, and so if you look at it, it's very fun. It's very clean. Yeah, it's I, th easy I don't to think use. this is going to be some large business unless they say. You know, for about a fiver, and you could, you know, make it tweak a, it a you can tweak it up and down. But I guess it's, it's basically 99 designs, it looks like to me. And it's like, Mahal, it's a Mahalo Answers has a currency in it, right? Sure. Uh, so, yes, I do believe that giving people money for doing tasks is an interesting idea. Uh, and sure, there's things. If I wanted to write something up, if I'm not a good writer and I want to have somebody write a press release, I might pay somebody $25 to do that. Be five fivers, so yeah. maybe it's maybe they just make five the denomination of the site. Yeah. So you could have a two five or a ten fiver, you know. This is a <laughs> six fiver, right. yeah, whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? Would you invest in that? Probably not. Probably I mean, not. it sounds like it sounds like a. Uh, we I have a, a category. I have a blog post called Unis. You know, you eat, eat sushi, right? Uni. Yeah. U N I user, not investor. You know, it's something I might use, but mm -hmm. I don't think I'll be an investor. Uni, I like Uni. it. Yeah, yeah. Not everybody likes uni. Now I know that. It's, <laughs> it's an acquired very, taste. You acquired I'm, I'm taste. Not, I love sushi. I but love not, not the that uni into with it. the with the quail egg on top. I do too. Not the uni fan. Yeah. I used to. But I anyway. That's a different story. <laughs> no. I was going to tell a story that I just realized would not be appropriate for. <laughs> 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 Let's keep going. Okay. No, we're done. Oh. Uh, we're done. We're done. We're done. It's just, we can't go on forever. Right. There's yeah. another show after this. Oh, uh, that's right. This Howard, week in Android. This week in Android at four o'clock. Let me once again thank Howard. You were an amazing guest. You were honest. You brought a lot of good advice. Uh, people loved it. Everybody in the uh, chat room, please rate the show. 
uh, and of course um, write blog posts about you know a blog post about the show if you liked it or whatever. There's another thing this week in this week in startups. Yes, so somebody, somebody, somebody has started, started that, a yeah. podcast about this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the meta podcast. It's a meta it podcast. Is. It's very it's called, meta. Uh, it's this week in this week in startups, I believe. Is that the URL this week? Oh, in? I don't know if that's the URL. That's the name of the of the show. It's some simple. It's it is. I think it's Twee Twist or something like T W I Twist. I mean, these guys have lost their mind. No, it's it's uh, this week in Twist. Yes, there you so, go. So uh, you see, they do how not to be a fat bastard, and this mm-hmm. is their like literally. F- it's I think they did forty minutes last week. It's and it's awesome. Like it's they, very thorough. They, they, they what they I love really about the, what, what, this week and this week in tech is uh, this week in uh, <laughs> this week in startup <laughs> is that they um, they they're like handicapping. Like I think Jason was tired because of the kid. Right. It's sort of like they're it, it, it's like ESPN <laughs> oh, this week in startup. They're like Tyler's camera was broke and Tyler has a it was a one insight thing and the, oh it's like know, that yeah. what was this e show about soaps where they where they had all the, the show every day about the other daily shows yeah oh, it's, it's like talk soup, soup. Talk right. soup. Yeah. Talk yeah, soup. but yeah. except it's just them obsessing about just this <laughs> <laughs> and right. they're like and you know I think the uh, Shark Tank was particularly good they, but they really as Jason down, was yeah. weak I mean they're really breaking down <laughs> each segment of the show and I'm thinking now you have two hours of this show. And you have to then listen to that. It's 45 minutes of that. Yeah. And I listen to about, I may have to hire these guys. I'm thinking about well, hiring them. It's like them how Stern just, started doing the wrap-up show. It's like you the wrap-up show. Up in, yeah. I think I have to bring these guys on board to network and have them do the show in between because what happens between this week and next. That's a good idea. I have the, like, between the main shows on the This Week in Network, every, we have them every, show yes, up and yes, comment. Yeah. Yes, the This Week in Network. And thisweekend.com will be up and running soon, at some soon. point. We've seen uh, early uh, The best way to box. get in touch with Howard if you want him to invest in your company is? Howard at firstround.com. There's an email address, Howard at firstround.com. Uh, and really, honestly, the things that you look for, uh, a nice long-winded email, <laughs> that meanders and just doesn't go anywhere and tells the person's life story or the URL of some cool piece of software? Well, the first is easy because we have an instant pass category. Right. <laughs> and the second, uh, it would be a lot better. Right. So it's my, always my piece of advice to entrepreneurs. Do not email them at 3 in the morning when you're going crazy about your idea and you're super excited. That's like calling the girl after the first date at 2 in the morning and telling her how much you love the date. It's just chill. You have to have the product done have some mock-ups at the very least, and send something. Even if they send you a screenshot of what it would be, then you can at least imagine what it is. And that doesn't take that but much. Don't time. send a .doc because I don't open them. Cause yeah, of course. <laughs> and then that's the worst thing. I mean, you think I have room in my... I don't need your PowerPoint. I mean, you don't well, need Well, I don't need your PowerPoint. I don't need your viruses, which exactly. I, I, so I exactly. won't open it. <laughs> Just when you have the URL, that's the best time. And you write two sentences. This is the da da I'm taking on this market. Here's a URL. I would love to tell you more if you're interested. Done. And it's so easy to get a URL for your stuff. I mean, you can GoDaddy. You can get get something up in and 20 I, minutes. GoDaddy's not a sponsor. Okay, can we? <laughs> easy on the GoDaddy. But you know who has a sponsor? Bing. 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 Yes. Bing. And DNA Mail, WebSpy, PowerVPS, uh, Ustream, and NetDNA. Thank you for the fast downloads. We'll see you all at South by Southwest. Tyler, great job on the Open Angel Forum. You're a hero. Uh, Really help those companies out. We appreciate it. Uh, any final comments or thoughts from Tyler? Looking forward to next week, live from South by Southwest. Oh, you're coming? Oh, yeah, I'll oh, be you're there. Gonna, you're going to make it to that show? Yeah, I'll you make it. You didn't make it today, but you made <laughs> yeah. it. Okay. I think we have to dock his pay for this show. Oh, wait, he's not getting paid for this. Uh, Lon, <laughs> great job. And I uh, heard this week in Twitter was great this morning. Yeah, really good one this morning. Uh, Lana Joy and Sean Percival were our guests. Uh, right. Okay. Very in depth. Uh, and this week in cloud computing is on Wednesdays, and that is doing phenomenal. Really amazing. If you look at the downloads on that, it's pent up demand. Rushed yeah. into second place on the whole network behind uh, this show. Nah, right I, here. I don't need competition here. Can somebody <laughs> put some stumble upon credits and get my show downloaded more? Uh, You're still okay. in first place, but not as clearly as you might have thought. Uh, this Sunday, Kevin Pollack will be doing his live ball busting. I'm sorry, delete that from the podcast. Chop busting. Bleep that out because we don't want to lose our iTunes rating. He will be busting chops with a bunch of other comedians on Kevin Pollack's chatshow.com. While watching the Oscars, I have heard some names of people. I'm not going to mention. He's not allowed here. to say who's coming. I've heard some names of people who are coming. It's and going to be nuts. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be nuts. And I'm yeah. thinking about maybe. Yeah. Anyway, it's going to be nuts, and we'll see you all next time on this week in startups.
Spiked out, I could trip a referee Tell by my attitude that I most definitely leave from